my mother, my father, denied me religion, disallowed me to read or write for over 300 years. They reduced me to the level of an animal where they branded me on my chest, branded me on my pockets with a branding iron. And they called me three-fifths of a human being in the American Constitution. Is that the act of a human being or the act of a devil? Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread? Let's deal with common sense. The Egyptians of antiquity, not the Egyptians you see today in that land, okay? That you suck that land, let the Yuka build that land. Really just is out into the Sudan land, okay? The Sudanese, okay? Understand that. The Ottoman Turks and the Arabs got together and pushed them out. So when you understand it's the Egyptians of antiquity that I asked about, The evil that men should turn their brothers into beasts of burden. To slave and suffer in dumb anguish. Be stripped of spirit and hope and faith. Only because they are of another race. Another creed. Where's your kingdom? Where's your land? Where's your castles? Before Alexander, name it, you can't, because it does not exist. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. Shalom and blessings, family. I hope everybody's doing well. Shabbat shalom to all my brothers and Israelites, sisters out there. It's your brothers from Sword of the Earth Productions at it again with another profound lesson. Shabon, Shabbat Shalom, brother Najib, brother Lasha, how y'all brothers doing? Brother Najib. Hey, brothers. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was on mute trying to get off. Uh, hope everybody's doing well on this Shabbat. It's always a uh, Great day to relax and, and be able to think about and focus on the most high and everything he's done for us. So I'm in a good place today. How you doing, brother Elisha? Yeah, Shabbat Shalom, my brother Banya, my brother Najid. I'm, I'm blessed. Um, a lot of things going on in the world, a lot of a lot of things that looks like is leading leading to our deliverance. You know, so I'll say all praise to the most high, and then I guess we'll address those things. Those things are really pertinent to our people uh, sometime soon. But uh, today, I'm um, going to go into, you know, calling on the name of the Most High and how important that is in today's climate. Brother Banya. Shalom. All right. So um, I want to start off with this scripture right here. <clears throat> Revelations 14 and 1 says, and I saw another angel fly. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Wrong one. 14 and 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on a Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. All right. So the reason why we want to talk about the Most High's name, and this, this is entitled, Whosoever Should Call Upon the Name. Well, let's get another scripture to actually convey why. All right. <clears throat> All right. So Romans, Romans 10 and 13 says. Who for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then should they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? All right. So one, one of the mission statements that we had is that we believe that the most high's name is according to Exodus 3 and 14. Would it be 3 and 14? Brother Elisha? Yes. Yeah, brother, 14, yes. According to Exodus 3 and 14, the name that the Most High gave Moses is the name that we believe 
uh, correlates to the name that we will be saved by. Now, um, this is to say it's important for us to disseminate that information to the people so that they understand who the Most High is and why we call on him as we do. Um, so amongst those those scriptures, we said that the name would be written in the foreheads. Now, another thing that we see that's significant is that there's a mark. Now, also in Ezekiel, it, it tells the angel to go through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sign cry for all the abominations that be done. And then you, you look in Revelation 14 and 1, and it says that there's a mark on the foreheads of the 40, 144,000, which is the name of the Most High uh, written on their foreheads, or their, his father's name written on their foreheads. And then the polar opposite of that, you have people who have the mark of the beast, which is written in their foreheads. So this, these, these things are actually signs of who's a, who you are, your allegiance is to. Um, is your allegiance to the beast? Is it your allegiance to the father? You know, this, this lesson that the brother Lasha put together is pertinent because it, it actually goes in, talks about, you know, um, the origin of some of these, uh, the tetragrammaton to be, to be precise and why we call in the most high's name. But I actually want to pass it over to brother Lasha so he can expound a little bit more on some things that are pertinent to understanding when it comes to the most high's name. Yeah. Um, I mean, when it comes to the name of the most high, I know this is a, um, a long, hard fought debated question. And so we can probably just lean on. Nobody knows the proper pronunciation to the most high's name. If you go back to, I believe 970 AD, there was a person by the name of, uh, I believe his name was um, Moses Ben Levi Ben Asher, if I'm not mistaken. And he translated the, the Lippo Codex. And when he translated the Lippo Codex, and I believe 970 AD, I could have butchered his name a little bit, but he had about two names in a Bon Asher to end it off. When he did that, um, it was supposed to be a long strength tradition of the Masoretes that that copy of the Hebrew scriptures, which is supposed to be the oldest one, came from copies that have, that we had in 70 AD before the, for the Jerusalem was sacked. Now, there's no proof of that. There's no proof that that so-called transliteration or translation came from a copy that was directly from the one in 70 AD. But we do know that Ben Asher, he is the one who incorporated the vowel points. Like he's the one where when you see the vowel points in the modern day scriptures, he put those in there. Like he's he's credited for that. Matter of fact, um, there's actually another dude too um that goes along with that with that particular uh scholarship. But the point is this is that when we think about the most high's name, we think about it hebraically. It should just be as simple as going to going to the book of Exodus and reading what was said. And we know according to Exodus six and three, if some one of you brothers don't mind reading Exodus six and three. Um, which will be supported in, in the uh, lesson that we did, that the Most High never revealed a name all the way up until the burning bush. Can right, somebody give me Exodus 6 and 3? I'm grabbing it now. All right, so Exodus 6 and 3. And it says, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Now, we know Jehovah is a uh, distorted translation. There was no J's. We can go through the whole spell on that. But the Most High said he never revealed his name up until Moses at the burning bush. So now the main question is Exodus 3.14 or Exodus 3.15 is the name. Some people say we say Exodus 3.14 because the Most High reverse 3.14, brother. Uh, I'll be 13.2. Okay. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, 
What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Now let's stop right there real quick. It really, you would think in no, under normal circumstances for all Israelites and probably all the people on earth that read the scripture, that this would be suffice to say that this is what the Most High said, the exact words, tell the people I am have sent me unto you. And we know that's translated out of respect for the Most High. We'll just say the letters, Aleph Ha Yah Ha, which would be four letters as well as what we commonly know the Tetragrammaton to be. So we would think this would be suffice that this is what the Most High said. But read verse 15, brother. And God said, moreover unto Moses, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, this is the verse that brings some ambiguity, at least amongst the community of our brothers and sisters, that this is where we would get the YHWH. And no matter what way you want to say, some people say Yao, some people say a, a, a plethora of different pronunciations. But this would be where you would have a standoff that the Lord God of your fathers is where we get the Tetragrammaton from and the variations of how it's said. So now we have two sets of people saying two different sets of things. Brother, grab me the verse up when Pharaoh said, I know not that God. Grab that up real quick. Yeah. Before before so, you, before we go there, go I want to make a statement. You know, um, and I understand the Hebrew and the English, they're, they're not the same. But what this shows right here with these, the, the capitalization of these names, whoever translated this obviously felt that there was some significance in what was being said when the Most High gave those names, that they would capitalize that. Now, the capitalization of of uh, of, of of letters. What do they? Can any of you brothers tell me what that indicates? As I as I uh, look for this uh the the scripture for the Pharaoh. Well, the the capitalization was was to bring to to put some emphasis behind it, somewhat like an explanation point. So that's to say to draw extra attention to it when you have capital letters outside of um, the regular letters. Not to mention that in the Hebrew, there was no uppercase and lowercase. But in this context, it was to be to emphasize it. Okay. And what, which scripture is that? Look, grab, grab the one where um, Pharaoh said he knew not your God. Now, it, it, the reason this is important is because if we believe the Most High, we're only talking about if we believe the Most High. You know, the most high said what I bet what I told you of your fathers to obey my voice. So we got to go by what the most high said. He said, I spoke not to your fathers in the day about burnt offerings and sacrifice. But what I did say was obey my voice and you should be my people. Now it should be your God. I believe that's Jeremiah 7, um, 22 and 23, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 21 down to 23. So we know that the most high said what the name was. And we know from Exodus 6 and 3, he never revealed a name up until he spoke to Moses at the burning bush. So all the times that we see in Genesis leading up to Exodus 3 and 14, those references of a capitalization of the word Lord and that the Tetragrammaton was there, or even any monuments or any names, like even in the name Judah, that something has to be amiss if the most high never gave a name if the most high now i know some people debate this and oh, the most high gave his name early on and, and that's going to be addressed but the reason that we should bring this up about pharaoh was that pharaoh said he never heard of this particular god he said i know not that god well i will not let the people go and that's yeah, important I'm to to say, so, i do not know what hey brothers hey, i i got it it's exodus uh chapter 5 verse 2 Exodus 5 and read 2, that, thank you. Yeah, uh, you want me to read uh, from, I'll read from verse 1. All right. All right, brother. And afterward, and afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus said the Most High of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Most High, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? 
I know not the most high, neither will I let Israel go. Now, when when Moses has spoke to Pharaoh, he said the name. He said the name that the most high gave to him. Now, did he say Exodus 3.14? Did he say Exodus 3.15 when we get to the Tetragrammaton? What did he say? Now, in the common breakdown is that he spoke the Y-H-W-H-O. And this is the thing. For anybody who uses that name, whatever way you spell it, that's not really where we're going with it's not about the spelling this is just the fact that whatever way you phrase it spell it this is what he, that we're that is being implied that he said now what if i was to say that the bible is translated through the greek translations what if i was to say that what if i was to say that the greek septuagint the kodak Sinaiticus, and several other greek versions that right now and i don't want to sprout them all off but that those versions are what was translated into hebrew and then translated into english and that in the greek septuagint the only word for god that we commonly use was curios that when the translation comes out that you see the tetragrammaton six thousand times there is no historical reference for that what if when we quote that when we say that that never happened all the times we looked in the beginning of the Bible, we say, oh, it was the most high's name was written 7,000 times. What if I told you there is not one document that supports that of the ancient Hebrew? And that the closest thing that you can get to that is the Lipo, the Lipo Codex, the, Lip, the Leningrad Codex, and the Biblia Hebraica that come from 970 AD. And that those translations nobody through history can tell you where they were translated from only that it's a tradition of the Masoretes to say that it had been translated from the old temple period in 70 AD and that most of your Greek oh most of your translations are translated from Greek and that they chose to imply that everywhere they saw curios meant the tetragrammaton meant YHWH hmm. if I was to say that how could you dispute that Maybe with the Mo, the Mishle Stile, maybe with the Shalomo inscription, because you see the Tetragrammaton there. But what if we went back to ancient Babylon? So I'm gonna show um a reference. I have a uh, question a, for you, brother Lasha. How many how many versions do we have of the Tetragrammaton? How many different variations would you say they have? I've I've heard you talk about the ones that brothers use today that they use uh, known and unknown i mean i don't know the unknown i mean i know that there's many different spellings i mean the the the, the, the thing is that the tetragrammaton's origins actually started off with three letters but um i'm not sure if that's the question that you're asking no i'm, I'm asking how like basically how many different pronunciations do you have for it? I mean, shoot, brother, I guarantee the people that's in the room right now have a bunch of different pronunciations. Yao, Yahweh, Yawa, Yahoo, Yahweh. It's just so many of them. I don't know all of them. Yahuwah. Right. You know, and I don't even like saying them, saying, you know, just sprouting yeah. them off. But, but. All right, so how many, how many of the uh, of the Exodus 3 and 14 can be fine? How many different variations of that? I, I, only, I only know one, and that's the Aleph Ha Yaha. That's all, right, the only so that's, one I know all right, so I'm glad you said that because I, what I want to I want to show I want to show something here, all right? Because I think this is pertinent also, in understanding because I had a conversation with some brothers and I asked them this exact question here that I'm going to pose right now, all right? So in Hosea it says, it says in Hosea I start from uh, Hosea two and fifteen, and it says, and I will give her her vineyards from hence. In the valley of Acor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, and as in the days when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall and it shall be at that day, saith the most high, that thou should call me Ishi, and should call me no more Bailey. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and she and she shall no more be remembered by their name. So right here it says the names of balaam um would i be correct if i was to say that the what is the link between this uh this balaam and and in the actual uh tetragrammaton 
Do you know what that link is? Now you got you have the connections historically that the tetragrammaton literally means bell or bay, bell. Um, if you go into the concordance where you're at right now, and it's going to say one of the meanings of Bailey is, you know, uh, the tetragrammaton. So you would have that connection. That's if, you know, it says a symbolic name for, if you go back to it, your yeah, symbolic name for what it says, Jehovah. Now, mind you, when you see Jehovah, you just had it up. But when you see that word Jehovah, it's, it doesn't, it's really just saying the YHWH. They just talk about those four letters. So I, I want to make sure be clear that we're not uh, dividing up the different spellings. We're just going to say the YHWH, the Hebrew 30, um, was it 3860? I usually I know it pretty good. Um, go to the, the breakdown, go to the uh, one for the tetragrammaton. I think it's 3068 and 3069. The Hebrew 3068 and 3069 is the ones that you would see the tetragrammaton. So whatever way you say that those four letters is what we're talking about. It doesn't matter the, the, the pronunciation or the spelling. Just the four letters itself is the representation. So the thing that we want to talk about is was this, was this name around prior? And then the fact that it has four letters. The main thing is that initially in ancient antiquity, going back to ancient Babylon, I'm talking about during the time of Nimrod, the tetragrammaton was not a tetragrammaton. It didn't have four letters. It actually had three letters. And if you look at any Hebraic script that has that name on it, you'll see it's only three letters all the way up into the Mishli Stile. Well, what's the what's the you, reference number again? Uh, thirty sixty eight and thirty sixty nine. Thirty sixty eight. Okay. So when when you go when you go to the the concordance, we're just saying that it doesn't matter what way you say it or what way you spell it. It's it's just those four letters. You know, because everybody has a different way of spelling it. So right there, you'll see it says Yahweh. You got some people that say Yao. It doesn't matter. It just the, the four letters, period. But was that name around? If the Mosai said he didn't reveal his name up until Moses, then that means that the Mosai's name should have never been heard before prior to that. And that's what we, we want to talk about real briefly is that the three-letter version of the Tetragrammaton had been revealed. And it was only three letters prior to the Mishle Stile. And that's the first time that you'll see a four-letter version of the Tetragrammaton. So I'm going to share my screen in a second. I just want to show y'all a version. Now, mind you, the, the letterings that I'm going to show you is from ancient Babylon. And some may dispute that it's possibly or not possible that it's uh, a direct reference to... Um, any way you would pronounce the te tetragrammaton and God, because that's what it says here. But I, I just want to show that real quick. And we'll give just to give a little bit of clarity that this name was in circulation years before. And some people actually use it as affirmation that the, te that the most high, this is the most high's name because it was in circulation so long before. But then it would beg the question, if it was already in circulation, why did the most high say to Moses, I had never revealed my name? Some people don't believe that, you know, um, but Josephus and Philo, as we'll see in the video, affirmed that the Most High had not revealed a name all the way up until Moses. So let me share my screen real quick and we'll get we'll show that. So I'm going to share my screen. Give me one, two shakes of a lamb, lamb's tail. Uh, all right. For the brothers and sisters that are viewing right now, what I would like you guys to do is uh, uh, type type in type in the chat the name that you that you call on, um, as concerning the Most High. Um, if you can, just type in you know um, what what you believe the Most High's name is, so we can so we can kind of gauge the audience and and you know that way we can move accordingly. So we'll start right here. Can y'all see my screen? I see it. Yeah, we can see it, bro. Now, in, in this book, matter of fact, let's get the name of the book real quick. This particular chapter is Yahweh Before Moses. This is that this is that chapter. The actual book, I actually have the book. If y'all want the PDF to it, um, which is called A Biblical Archaeology of the Bible. 
Um, but we're actually going to bring this this information out in more detail later on. But mind you, I'm going to get leave a caveat. It is disputed whether this is the name of the tetragrammaton, but it has the similitude of it. So we're going to start right here. It says, when Yahweh as the first element of a personal name was written in cuneiform, a cuneiform, in the Persian period, it was sometimes written Yah or sometimes Yahu. Yahu being in the Hebrew vernacular, or what's going, and sometimes Yahu, which is Yad Ha Wa, which is the first three letters to the tetragrammaton. We all knew that. No matter what way you want to pronounce it, it's the first three letters. And we got some biblical art, we got some artifacts that will show you that initially that there was a name in circulation way back as far as the time of Abraham that actually had these three letters. It says, if we may reason that the same varieties of phonetic expression existed in the time of the first dynasty of Babylon, we should find that the name Yahweh as the first element in the names of Yelelu and Yahu Elu, which occur in the text from Delbet, which was written in the Kanea form or Kuni form. This would add another group of occurrences of the name in Babylonian texts of this period and also another to the forms under which it appeared now and the reason that we're showing that these first three letters were represented early on is that pharaoh would have knowledge of these first three, three letters why because inside the um so um an inscription about the edomites it says yahweh of the shia or the shiatsu of uh yahoo which is just the three first three letters is not the four that y'all most people will commonly pronounce but just the first three which means that the first three was in circulation as a God known in the earth by different communities of peoples. So what does this mean for us right now? These first three letters in circulation. I want to grab up. If somebody can just brother, grab me up um, the book of Jasher real quick. And we're just going to show that people were even naming themselves after these, these letters. And I just want, I want to be clear that I'm saying these letters because it's not the four the four didn't come into the four letters that we that people commonly use came later on so i just want to make that clear but it's a reason that we say that this name was in circulation so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen brother grab up the book of Joshua real quick grab it i got it what, what page uh matter of fact just go just type in uh a d o n i a h a D O N. Okay. Now I don't know, but just to give a little bit of history, is that when Moses, and this is confirmed in inside the book of Josephus, Moses at some point married the queen or a high prominent female in Ethiopia. Now, according to Josephus, it's a little different than what is said in Jasher, is that when the queen, or I'm sorry, this this woman, the daughter of the king, at least I'm gonna go by Josephus' account because it's more of a historical record, because Jasher says it differently, but we'll just rock out with this. She saw Moses attacking the city of Ethiopia when he was when he was one of the generals in Egypt, and she fell in love with him. She said, this man got a great valor. So anyway, to save the city, she, she, uh, she sent messages to Moses, and Moses agreed to marry her to, so that the Ethiopians wouldn't be overthrown. So this is the Ethiopian wife that Miriam is talking about, when she says that Moses married an Ethiopian, that Moses actually did marry an uh, uh, Ethiopian. Now, in this Ethiopian, her name was historically a little different than what you might find on Google, but we're going to look at how the word, how her name is in the book of Jasher. A D O N what? Just put A D O N, you should, it, should, it should pop up. You can't find right, it, I'll grab it. Uh, I, I I see it several. Let me let me show you because there's several of them here popping up here. So just it should be A D O N I A H. Right. Uh, it might be um. If you're still looking for it, bro, I, I actually I actually got it. All right, brother, brother, uh, Naji got it. So, brother, if you don't mind sharing your screen and showing that. Now, mind you, this is this is the time when Moses is actually still ruling in Egypt. So this is prior to any name being given. But we're going to look at the name of the queen of Ethiopia. And we remember 
the one the one who started the inception of the babylonian kingdom of babel was nimrod and nimrod was from kush now kush is ethiopia so read read that verse 37 brother all right and all the people and nobles swore unto him to give him for a wife adonia the queen the cushite wife of kiki kiki Anus. And they made Moses king over them on that day. Now, they made Moses king over them. Now, according to the book of Philo, I mean, I'm sorry, jo uh, Josephus, they didn't make Moses king per se. But the point is this, is that the acronym in her name or the pre the suffix in her name is, it, her name would mean what? Lord Yah. Now, everybody inside the comments, if you were to see that name in the Bible, how would you translate that name? A-D-O-N-I-A-H. I'm saying that we would translate that Lord Yah or Lord Yahu. Anybody else concur with that inside the chat? I can go. Brother, matter of fact, why you wonder, Brother Naji, Google the meaning of the name Lord Yah, I me, mean, uh, Adanya. Google that real quick. Okay. All right. Uh, in Hebrew, baby names, the meaning of Adonijah is the Lord is my God. The Lord is my God. You might have some that will come up that, that actually say Lord Yah. If you go into the Bible versions, anytime you see I-A-H at the end of a name, we just imply that it means Yah or Yahoo. I guess after a, a, a relationship with the Masoretes or the Jewish people, they'll just say, Lord, my God. But we know Adon means Lord and I-A-H would mean Yah or Yahu. So at this time, particularly, we know that at least the three letter version of this name is in circulation before Moses even leaves Egypt. I'm going to share my screen real quick just to show some of the other three letter versions of this name and know that it was in circulation. A long time before we before the most high gave us a name so i'm just going to show something real quick and the reason that we're bringing this out is to say if the most high said he never revealed a name but this particular name was in circulation at least the three-letter version then the most high could not have revealed a name or had not revealed the tetragrammaton in exodus 315. So let me grab this up real quick. We're just going to look at some of the three letter versions real quick. Now, if you look at this one right here, this is an older one that, that was found and it's called the Mount Ewu Amalek. And it says the divine name YHW from Mount Ewu. Now you can see the letters Yah, Wah, Wah. When you look at those letters early on in antiquity, this name, this was in circulation by the three letter version. But how did it become four? It's not until you get to the Moabite stone. If brother grab one of your brothers, grab up translation of the Moabite stone. And then you'll see that this is the first time in antiquity that you have a four letter version of this three letter word. It's that the, the high at the end of it was added later on. Why was it added later on? Now, everybody knows that the name God gave to us is four letters. This letter is this name is three. It's three all the way up until you get to the Moabite stone. And guess who it was who actually had the four letter version? The Northern Kingdom. We'll grab up the translation of the Moabite stone, brother, and we're going to read that real quick. Translation of the Moabite stone. Let's grab the translation of the Moabite stone. Okay. Now, even with Kwam Yasharan, it's important why it was in circulation. Why was it in circulation if the Most High never revealed it? Now, we don't know of anybody that's quoting Exodus 3.14 as being in circulation. But just grab up any anyone that you can find that got the translation of the Moabite Stone, and we'll read that. Which I have one already, but matter of fact, we could just look at the one I got if you can't find it. Just click it's on right anyone. It should. Right. You see it? Yeah, just just give us the translation. Is that it right there? No, nah, that's not enough. This is more than that. 
You should give the whole translation of the Moabites, though. I'm trying to see what exactly it is. This, yeah, you just, pass, you just pass it. This one there. Just scroll, keep scrolling down. It's going to say, I am in Kamash. There you go, right there. That's the translation of the Moabite stone. So, and we'll Wait. just expand that, and we're going to read some of that real quick. Expand this right here? Yeah. Right there. They said the text of the Moabite stone. And this is important. When you read the Moabite, I know a lot of people use the Moabite stone as to affirm that the most high's name is YHWH. But that's not actually the reason for the Moabite stone. What does the Moabite stone actually say? I'm going to read some of it real quick. And then we're going to go to the book of Kings. It says, I am Mishe, the son of Kamash Yadi, the king of Moab from Dibian. My father was king over Moab for 30 years and I was king after my father. When we did the video about showing that Moab might be the Palestinians, we talked about the controversy that Moab had, that they believed they owned a portion of the northern kingdom. And it says, in Kochaf, I made this high place for Kamash, which is the god of the Moabites, because he was because he has delivered me from all kings, and because he was made, because he has made me look down on my enemies. Omri was the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days. For Kamash was angry with the land, and his son succeeded him. He said, He too I will oppress Moab. In my days he did so. But I looked down on him and on his house, and Israel has gone to ruin. Yes, it has gone to ruin forever. That's when the Most High uh, sent our people into slavery to surrender death. Second Kings chapter 17. Omri had taken possession of the whole land of Medeba. This was their controversy that we had took some of the land, which you can see that Jephthah talks about because Jephthah writes letters back and forth to the king of Moab in the book of the Judges. And he lived there in, in his days, in the half of the days of his son, 40 years. But Kamash restored it in my days, and I built Bel Mayon, and I made it, it a water reservoir. And I built Karethim. And the men of Gad lived in the land of Astara from ancient times. Now, and that's key that it says the tribe of Gad. Because when we go to the book of Judges, I want you all to remember that it said the tribe of Gad real quick. It says, and the men of Gad lived in the land as Atara from ancient times. And the king of Israel built Atara for himself. And I fought against the city and I captured and I killed all the people from the city as a sacrifice of Kamash and for Moab. And I brought back the fire earth of Deb Debdo from there. And I hauled it before the face. Scroll up, brother. I need you to scroll up, brother. I'm scrolling up. All right, right there. Yeah, you good right there. And it says, I fought against the city and I captured and I killed all the people in the city and the sacrifice of Kamash and Moab. And I brought back the fire earth of Dado from there. And I hauled it before the face of Kamash and Kiriath. And I made the men of Sharon live there as well as, as the men of Merrimeth. And Kamash said to me, go and take Nebo from Israel. Now stop. We're going to stop right there. He said he told Kamash told him to go take Nebo from Israel. We go in the book of Isaiah it says, um, Bel sitteth and Nebo stupeth, Nebo being a calf god. Now he's saying, now we remember in the book of the Kings that Rehoboam said, These be your gods, and he put two calves in the in the temple at Samaria. Now, in these two calves, he said he called on the Lord. He called on what you would say is the Tetragrammaton. And he said, he said unto me, go take Nebo from Israel. And I went in the night and I fought against it from the break of dawn until noon. And I took it and I killed its whole population, even 7,000 male citizens and aliens, female citizens, citizens and aliens, and the servant girls. For I had put it to the band of Ashtar Kamash. And from there, I took the vessels of Yahweh, of, you know, the Tetragrammaton, and I hauled them before the face of Kamash. And that says, I took the vessels of Yahweh, or Yahweh, or Yahuwah. It says he took the vessels of it from there. Now, the calf that he actually took out that he's referencing to is Nebo, or even YHWH, is a calf that he took out of the temple of the northern kingdom. 
that when you read the Moabite stone, he's documenting that he took the vessels, which literally the physical vessels that was represented by this calf that they call Yahweh, and he took it out the temple. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that he's saying that the actual name of the Tetragrammaton was something he took out the temple? And because if we go into another artifact called Bell and his asterisk says Yahweh of Samaria and is represented as a golden calf, and we'll show that real quick. So what this is documenting is that the YHWH, which is the first time you'll see the four letters, was a calf taken out of the temple in Samaria by the Moabites. And we're going to prove that with this with this artifact right here, where it represents that Yahweh was a calf of Samaria or, or that they use that name as a calf. I don't want to offend anybody. All right. So we're going to go to and we're going to grab this up real quick. Uh, where is it at? Give me two shakes. Because I got it on here somewhere. Uh, just give me two seconds. See. Uh, here we by go. Right show, here. By show of hands or by show of ones, how many brothers and sisters seen the lesson that we did called the true name of the most high? By show of ones. By show of ones, how many brothers and sisters seen the lesson that we did called the true name of the most high? Show of ones. If y'all can, if they can see the uh, artifact right here, this artifact is called Yahweh in his in some of Samaria and his Asherah. And Yah or the Tetragrammaton is being represented by two caps. Now going in the book of Kings, can everybody see that? No, it's not. Well, you're I mean, not. You're not. You're not sharing your screen. All right, let me let me share my screen real quick. All right, I thought I was sharing my screen. All right, let's go back. Here's a question: right. Why why you why you going there? Is it possible that the that they apply Yah's name to the bulls? Yes, yeah, it is possible that they applied it, but th th this is the caveat: is that the three letter version that you use right away, the three letter version of the YHW was already in circulation by other nations prior to us ever getting a name from the most high. Mm -hmm. So we're one that, so what we're getting to is how did it get to a four letter version? Because everybody knows that the most high gave us four letters. We, we read about that in Josephus. We read about it in Philo. The most high gave us four letters, but this name in particular that Pharaoh had never that uh, when he said he never heard of it, this actually had three letters. It wasn't until later on that the Tetragrammaton became four letters. And that's what we're showing. When you look at the Moabite stone, that's the first time in history is represented as four letters. Prior to that, it actually was in circulation. That's why we went into the book of Jasher. It was circulated as YHW. It was actually around. So why did it have four letters when, it, when we finally took it as a God, when the Northern Kingdom separated from the house of David. So I'm going to share my screen real quick just to show that the Northern Kingdom did call the Tetragrammaton. It was known by Yahweh of Samaria and it was represented by a golden calf or by a calf. And the reason that we're showing that is just to establish that it wasn't until the Northern Kingdom gave it a four, made it a four letter word that it actually been, became the synonymous with our people. So I'm going to grab that up real quick. If, if everybody can see my screen, matter of fact, I'll just bring it up on my PowerPoint real quick. So I got another one. Um, that's a whole nother lesson, but let me grab it up on my uh, PowerPoint. Let me see. Is this the one I'm that's looking for? That's interesting. Only one person out of the whole room actually seen that lesson? Hey, Brother Barney, I think we had a couple ones uh, up top. I think we got like we got like four, but you know, which, which I, I would hope that more people saw it, but but we got like four ones. Okay. Uh, let me see. I think this is my PowerPoint that I did on. All right, here we go. Because you should be able to see it easier here. All right, here we go. Can y'all see that? Yeah, we can see it. All right, let me see. So I'm, I'm going to expand it more. 
It won't let me expand it more, but we'll just rock out with this. You see here that if you look it up, it's called, and it's at um, Coret Jaluth. I can't remember pronounce it the right way, but this was found a tablet or pot share, and it says Yahweh of Samaria. That's how it was, it's translated Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. And the Northern Kingdom was synonymous because the, the Tetragrammaton was actually called by four letters by them. It started off as three letters, and we could show a lot of different ancient artifacts where it was three letters. But it, it wasn't until some uh, our brothers of Samaria got it that it became four letters. Now, how did it become four letters? How did they get the H at the end? Now, mind you, this is us looking into the scriptures precept upon precept, and this is not something where I'm going to say, hey, listen, this is absolute um, fact. I got a historical reference that proves this is why they did it. But we have something in the scriptures that show a similar circumstance where the northern kingdom added an H to a word to be distinguished. And it used it with the tribe of Gad that did it. And if you notice inside the Moabite stone, it brought up the tribe of Gad that was living in Astar. So, brother, grab up Judges chapter 12 for me. I think verse 6. I think it's verse 6, if I'm not mistaken. Want me to want me to read it? Yeah, yeah, grab, yeah, grab, grab it. Up, me, me the right verse. I think it's Judges chapter four, 12 and 6. Uh yeah. Then said they unto him, say now. Show, show it on the screen, brother. Okay. Give me two seconds and it will be on the screen. Uh here we go. <clears throat> And after we do that, we I might you might I might want you to grab the concordance numbers with it, if you can. But you just read it real quick. Okay. Then said they unto him, Say now, Sheboleth. And he said, Siboleth, for they could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passage of Jordan. And there fell at Stop. that time. Go ahead, just finish it up. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. Now, if you stop right there, if you go back to it, says, and they said unto him, now, say now Shibboleth. And they say, he said, Sibboleth. Now, and the reason that the Galites did that is because they knew that the Ephraimites pronounced the word without the high in it. Now, if we can grab the concordance in it. So the only difference in these two words is an H. They added an H. To the way they spoke the word Sibboleth, they added Shibboleth. Now, this H was the whole difference between the way the Ephraimites spoke it. And when he didn't say it with the H, they killed him. That let him know that, that he was not from Gilead. Now, Brother Bonnie, if you don't mind bringing up this same verse in the concordance. Okay. So we, we're showing that there's a history of our brothers from the northern kingdom what they'll do is they'll add a slight difference to a particular word to make it distinguishable and in this case they just added an h and right, if you go into the Hebrew, you got the semi, huh which one was it again judges 12 and 6. okay so the difference is that they added the h to the word that made it from Sibolaf, which was a wood you would use the Hebrew letter Samak. Well, I don't know. Some people say Samak. It would be it would just be S A. And then you got the uh the Shin or the Shah, the Sham, which would be S H A. So the only Both difference is just that Shibola. Both Shibola and Shibola. Just just bring up the whole verse in um the concordance. We'll look at them, look, we'll look at them each after that. We'll just look right. at them one by one. So we'll see that the, the, the only difference is that the Galites added an H to the word. Now, like I said, that this is something that a connection that we're looking at as a plausibility. I'm not going to say that this is 100 percent fact. This is something that when looking at the scriptures, this is what we're seeing as a connection to why did the Tetragrammaton initially have three letters and it was only after it got to Samaria that it had four letters becoming somewhat parallel to the name the most High gave to us in exodus 3 14. but now having four letters the only difference is that it has an h at the end and once that happened then you start to see in our land that the h is represented 
in the tetragrammaton but prior to that it didn't have age all right so brother look up the word cibola just look at just look what just go start with the first one we'll go to all right so you can see inside it you see the samak go back brother go go back to the first one that you was on symbol all right you see that in the front of that lord that word is the samak so you got samak ba la kath so you see or thought ta so you see sabath it means sabalath now go to the go to the other one you can see that the difference is a shin here with the shin has a sha sound with an h and now you see the only difference in the word is the fact that you got the sha that has the h and you have the other one that doesn't have the h in it now this is the same difference that you would make with the earlier versions of the tetragrammaton when it only had three letters which was y h w or y h u or y h o whatever way you want to look at it and the fact that when it got to samaria during the time of the moabites now it has four letters so when we go into the book of the kings we go into book of the kings 113 i think it is i think is uh chapter the first kings I mean, i'm sorry first is the first kings chapter 13 where uh rehoboam says come to samaria these be thy gods go to chapter 13 i think it is uh-huh all right, it says it might be chapter 12. It might be chapter 12. Um, and this is when he's going to take the calves and he's going to say, These be thy gods, because he didn't want the, the, the northern kingdom to continue to go to Jerusalem. So, Rehoboam, so make sure. Take this first Kings. Go to go to Kip first Kings 12 28. And read down to verse 32. 28 to 32. First Kings chapter 12, verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now stop right there, brother. Now, when we looked at the artifact that said Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah, Asherah representing the other calf, and it showed two calves. Now, what did the king, what did Rehoboam say? He said he took two calves of gold and he placed it in the temple in Samaria. Continue, brother. <clears throat> and he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places and made priests of the lords of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. Now start right there. And I'm looking. I butchered it before I said Jer. I said Rehoboam is actually Jeroboam. So that was my mistake. I all in the while always mixed them up Jeroboam, Rehoboam. But it's actually Jeroboam that did this. Now I put anybody to task that can find an artifact. That has the four letter tetragrammaton before the Mishle Stele or the Moabite stone. Anyone you will find before that will have three letters. Why is this important? Because if you go into the book of Josephus, which we'll see in the video, he said that when the priest went into the temple, they had a they had a metri on four letters. So when Rehoboam, I'm getting it, I say Jeroboam, I say Rehoboam again. When Jeroboam was took over the northern kingdom, he had to mimic what our people served at jerusalem and he made sure that the name that would that he found there were three letters mind you this is I'm, I'm saying that this is how um spiritually i perceive this to be i don't want to make it look like i got an artifact that says exactly what i'm saying but the connection is obvious that the god that we that we served that the most high gave his name to moses had four letters 
And it's not until this time that the Tetragrammaton becomes the Tetragrammaton of four. It actually had three prior to that. And this is going on inside the Northern Kingdom when they had a temple at Bethel and Samaria in the, in the tribe of Dan. And then that's what the Moabites are talking about when they said they took the vessels of YHWH out of the temple at Samaria. They're saying they took the calves that were there. And it's clear that Jeroboam made calves because he says it there in 1 Kings, the 12th chapter, 28 to 32. Now, we got plenty more information on this to go deeper into it. And we're going to bring the multitude of that information out to show historically that there are a multitude of spellings or a multitude of citations of the Tetragrammaton in four and three letter form all the way up prior, I mean, prior to our people getting a name. And after that, it stayed three letters, even when it talked about the Shiatsu of the Edomites. It was three letters. It wasn't until it got to the Mishle Stile under the Northern Kingdom that we see it's a four letter word. And even some of the artifacts that go back to as far as 500 BC by the Persians, they still represented it as a name of three letters. Even uh, the yeah. Muslims prior in the old Kephardic language or the Kephardic language. Uh, what's the dude who did uh, Hebrews the Negroes? Uh, Ron Dalton. Ronald Dalton. When he spoke to a Muslim dude, he was talking about how prior to them using the word Allah, they used a Yahu or Yahu as the name of the Most High pre Muhammad. Again, three letters, you know. So just just to put out there that they had a history that went back to the to the ancient Kanea form of cuneiform that was three letters. Can't say that the ones that was Kephardic wasn't for. It's that like that the history went back to the three letter rather. So, brother, did y'all want to say anything before we proceed? Yeah, uh, just to make so so everybody can know, um, Genesis uh, chapter four and twenty six. We we're going to answer that too within the video, right? When it says, "And Seth to him also were born the sons, and he called his name Enos, and uh, then begin men to call upon the name of the Lord." Um, that's answered within the video, I believe, right? Yeah, that's one of the first things we established. So, um, okay. without further ado, and like I said, we're going to bring up, we got a multitude of more, uh, we got plenty more information on this subject and to establish it historically and biblically. Um, we just highlighted some of it leading into the video. So, um, Brother Bond, you want to shoot the video out? And um, if any, if there's any questions prior to us putting the video on, you know, you can shoot yeah. your shot. You hey, hey your brother Lasha, you just mentioned uh, the, um, you know, Ron Dalton and, and his uh, confirmation, or well, not confirmation, excuse me, what what he stated when he was he was speaking to uh, somebody. I, I know that that is a kind of a TikTok clip. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I know that sometimes we we kind of mention things, um, but the audience may not know exactly what we're talking about. Um, it's probably a good idea to just play that clip real quick. I think it's probably about a minute. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and um, play it, bro. Yeah, go, go. Do you have it? Do you have the clip? Uh, I gotta pull it up. All right, while you pulling it up, I'm gonna I'm gonna be addressing something too, just just to bring everybody up to speed everybody wasn't in, in here when we started off so i'm just going to read this scripture right here what's the relevance of this right now all right so in lieu of all the things that's going on the eclipse the the passover you know the 400 year mark right this is called the exodus whosoever should call upon the name now why are we doing that why are we speaking about that romans 10 and 13 says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how should they hear without a preacher so as as teachers and as brothers who disseminate information within our platform it is our duty to share with you what and why we believe in what we believe in why we believe the most high's name is what we believe his name is and we're going to share that information via video that we actually already got up on the site but this would be your opportunity to actually ask questions 
while you uh while you actually see the video going up right so i'm, I'm gonna grab the video up real quick i think um i'm gonna grab the video up which yeah. video brother and you know yeah he's going he's going to grab up the tiktok video because okay. i i actually do not have tiktok um yeah, so it, it'll be easier for brother lasha to grab it up real quick um again it's only about a minute but um Brother Ron Dalton says uh, says something really uh, really key there that I think um, may resonate with with the audience. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, you know, up next, well, uh, you know, um, this did there are scriptures that that counter that that understanding. Um, for instance. Let me let me grab the, uh, grab another one because this is this is uh when when Paul makes that statement of whosoever Paul was uh quoting right yeah why why you're grabbing that up brother Banya um I think where you took that from was Romans ten yes and yes. if you go to the beginning of Romans ten and you just read that first verse it talks about um paul is stating who he's addressing and who he's speaking to thank so, you a absolutely yeah so so okay. up next to answer your question i, I think um, it's obvious that paul in in that part of uh romans 10 he's he's addressing israelites he's he's only speaking to israelites or exactly. about israelites rather let me say yeah so he's actually quoting sure Joel, must... um He's actually calling jo Joel chapter two, verse 32. And it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right. So we, we as Israelites, we understand what that pertains to and who that pertains to. Right. Um, but, uh, you know those who don't frequent the channel they may not they may not know so uh thank thank you for bringing that up all right so we're gonna play the um brother uh, did you want to say something else before i play uh before you do that let's let's uh let's get that that uh get that fair use uh going real quick all right i'll play the fair use and then you can go ahead and put start on that Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. And this is a copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing nonprofit educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use all right so we're gonna um, play the video real quick let me know if y'all can hear it to, uh, guy from yeah y'all can hear it i hear it yep all you right. hear it he was on my side. And I said, hey, um, how do you say God in your language? He says, Allah. And I said, well, are you able to read the ancient inscription uh, in Babylon, the Assyrian Babylonian cuneiform web script? And he says, uh, Now, before, like, now you notice he said the ancient cuneiform script. The ancient, talking about going back to something we cited in the book of biblical archaeology of the Bible. When we said uh, Yahweh before Moses, he talked about the ancient. So he, they're identifying this the three letter version as the ancient right here. Just wanted to say that real quick. A little bit. I know what you're talking about because I showed it to you. He's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I said, well, what about the earliest Quran? The earliest Quran was written in Kufi. Uh, and he says, yes, Kufi. And I showed him Kufi. He says, yes. I see. I said, can you read that? He says, yes, I can read this a little bit. And I said, one. Uh, the earliest trans came out, and before the Muslims uh, knew about Muhammad, I said, uh, or the Arabs knew about Muhammad, I said, what did you guys call 
the name of the creator, the God of Abraham. And he looked at me and he said, Yahuwah. I said, Yahuwah? He says, wow. yes. And I said, Yah, Yahuwah? He says, yes. And I said, now, just just to just to highlight real quick, if you look at the way he's spelling that, he's actually talking about the three letter version. Now he's pronouncing it with the H at the end, but it says if you go, if you look at it, it says Yah, and the, it's just the Yah or the Y H W. It's not the H at the end. He's actually putting that in there himself, the Yahwah. But there's actually just if you look at the one where you see the two letters right here, it's actually Y H. W and then they're pronouncing the W with a Y. The H is not there. It's actually he's talking about a three-letter version here. So then why do you judge you guys change it to Allah? Immediately when I said that, he put his head down, got up and walked away. Now when people from really, uh, it's something else. Now I was talking to uh well that's that's the video right there now the way he spelled it we can actually go into the the um biblical archaeology of the bible and it'll show that it's actually spelled with three letters in the ancient kanea form or kuni form and that's what we were showing earlier and there's, there's several citations we can show sometimes it's y a w y h i mean y a h w e they'll spell it but either way in the lettering form is actually three letters anciently rather so he's saying that the Muslims went by the ancient Babylonian or Assyrian script, the cuneiform and cuneiform. And that cuneiform actually had a three-letter version of that name way before we became a nation and before um, the Northern Kingdom actually erected the temple. Like they had, before we even seen any four-letter version, they're talking about the ancient version. It was only three letters. So we're talking about almost 1,200 years of existence for over 1100 years of a three letter word now i can't stress it enough is that our the name that we brothers and sisters commonly use is called tetragrammaton because it means four that's the main that's what sets it apart tetragrammaton means four it had the letters you could you could chop them up any way you want but the historical reference of the name is actually connected to tetra or tetragrammaton meaning four why because even the name the most I gave is in Exodus 314 have four letters. It was Aleph Yah. I mean, I'm sorry, Aleph Yah Ha Yah. If I said that right, you yeah. know. So yeah, Aleph Ha Yah Ha. Four letters. So we have a mimic here that a, a name that actually had three letters, which we've seen also that the Queen of Egypt, I'm sorry, Ethiopia had, also turns into four letters all of a sudden. Right after it goes to Samaria. Brothers, want to say anything? No, no. Um, all I can say is, uh, brothers and sisters that didn't get a chance to see the video, um, what we're about to show you is undeniable truth of the Most High's name and what it is. Um, and if you're interested in that, then you know, um, you definitely want to tune in to what we're about to show. Because it's undisputed, it's uh, it's uncontested, uh, it's un unrefuted, right? Anybody got anything else? Oh, nothing else from me, bro, uh, brother Lasha, man. Thank you for uh, showing that little clip and explaining it. I think I do think that that helps. Um, people understand this, uh, what you're trying to say a little bit more. And as we go into this video, I think it's going to be <gasps> even more profound. Bless you, bro. <laughs> so let's get it. <laughs> Zoom <tight. laughs> right. So do me a favor, brother. Take take that, uh, take your share screen down. All right, so I want to do a test real quick to make sure everybody can hear it. Okay. While the brothers doing it, we just want to make make it known that it's very important that we obey the Most High's voice. That we're all saying the same thing, and it's not that we're trying to throw a monkey wrench in anything that is factual. We're trying to actually establish the fact, and you can never go wrong going by what the Most High said. And it's a been a concerted effort to get us not to do what the Most High said. Like it's, I mean, they went through 
leaps and bounds, the same way they went through leaps and bounds to, to steal our heritage. They went through a lot to make sure that we believed everything other than what the Most High said out of his mouth. Like, imagine being in the presence of the Most High. I'm like, yo, what did I say? What did I say? And what, what could we say in response that they that people explained it away to one us? That they said this or they showed me that? Like, what could we really say if the Most High said, what did I say? Mm -hmm. So let, let's we'll, we'll get that started, brother. Let me make sure y'all can hear. What we're dealing with today is the true name of God. Can you hear that? Can you hear that, brothers? No, I can't hear nothing yet. Try yeah, to I, 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 I heard it out. But, How about um, that? He out of his mouth and testified to historically. All right, so <laughs> did you hear that? Yeah, we can hear it now. Yeah. All right, great. All right, so I'm going to, before I even start, I'm going to mute my mic, and I'm going to start it. What we're dealing with today is the true name of God, um, spoken out of his mouth and testified to historically. So salutations to all the people that are not used to, to our channel. And, um, and of course, salutations to everybody in North. So Shalom. I'm your brother, Elijah, and together with my brothers, Banya and Najee, we intend to guide you on an enthralling journey. We will transport you back in time and immerse ourselves in the timeless debate that precedes even the writing of the Bible, the name of God. So what is the indisputable truth concealed within the appellation of the God of the Israelites? Throughout this journey, we will rely on ancient scriptures and historical sources as our guides, shedding light on profound truths that will unveil the answer to this paramount question. What is the standard process? Before we start this journey, we must lay down the foundational standard of how we approach biblical text, as it is written in the law of Moses out of the mouth of two or three, Witnesses, let every word be established. Brother Najib, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, please. As written in the law of the Most High, out of the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. This is shown in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinned. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. Brother Banya, what did God say to Moses? This is coming from the KJV Bible, Exodus 3 and 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Exodus 3 and 15. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now we see in the two representations of the name, we see Aleph, Ha, Yaha, uh, disseminated to us is a is ia we say ahaya and then we have inside verse 15 yad he wahe um depending on how you speak the hebrew and is often represented by the different forms that brothers say or articulate the tetragrammaton now the tetragrammaton what is the tetragrammaton and this is very important that we understand this from the Greek consisting of four letters or the tetragram in the four letter Hebrew proper name of the deity transliterated as YHWH or YHVH. Some people say Yao or the different names. We're not going to quote them all. The name of God in the Hebrew Bible. The word tetragrammaton, tetragram or telegraph or tetragraph generally refers to any group of four letters that represent sounds, 
not necessarily corresponding to those of the individual letters. So any group of four letters is considered a tetragrammaton. Just a quick highlight inside Exodus 314 and saying, uh, I am, that is four letters. It would represent in the basic root of the definition, also a tetragrammaton, just being four letters, any group, not, al not always the one we're synonymous with. Now we have some facts. Historically speaking, in reference to the Tetragrammaton, the only name the Most High gave for himself is I am the being. That's disseminated in the Septuagint, Exodus 3.14, which most translations of the Bible are you know, taken from, from the Greek, which indicated that he is to be identified with all existence. The Greek Septuagint, Old Testament of, two, of 285 BC, never used any sacred name for God nor was such ever mentioned by other ancient writers such as the is Israelite historians Philo and Josephus or the later Eusebius. The YHWH word did not appear in any Old Testament text until the Masoretic text of 1000 AD, nor was the existence of any Hebrew language Old Testament text ever mentioned by ancient theologians whose work was exclusively with the Greek Septuagint text. Now, the previous statement is not without contention, due in large part to artifacts that archaeologists have unearthed where the tetragrammaton, which is disseminated by YHWH in most situations, is written as the name of God. The tetragrammaton is universally held as the name the Most High had given to Moses in Exodus 3.15 and is written into Genesis 162 times and a total of 195 times leading up to Exodus 6 and 3. This is where we'll start our exploration into the name of the Most High. Brother Najib, it never been discovered. In Exodus chapter six, verse three, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah, tetragram YHWH, was I not known to them. Now, this is also confirmed in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Brother Najee, can you continue on to uh, our citation in Flavius Josephus? But I'll add one word. Um, the translations that you're looking at right here in Exodus 6 and 3 is only as it is written inside the KJV Bible. Um, we're not trying to push you in the direction to say that Jehovah or any form of the tetragrammaton written in Exodus 6 and 3 is how is what we're disseminating uh, as the name. We're just giving you the scripture as it reads, and um, you'll get the information as we go forward. So, Brother Najid, if you don't mind continuing with Flavius Josephus chapter 11, starting at uh, paragraph 275. Of course, brother. Antiquities of the Jews by Flavius Josephus in chapter 11. Moses, having now seen and heard these wonders that assured him of the truth of these promises of God, had no room left in him to disbelieve them. He entreated him to grant him that power when he should be in Egypt and besought him to vouchsafe him the knowledge of his own name. And since he had heard and seen him, that he would also tell him his name, that when he offered sacrifice, he might invoke him by such his name in his oblations. Whereupon God declared to him his holy name, which had never been discovered to men before, concerning which it is now lawful for me to say anymore. Well, not lawful to say anymore. Um, so we see here that according to Josephus, as well as the scriptures, the Most High had never revealed his name prior to Moses. Book of Philo on the name on the change of names, which would be another witness, Brother Banya, if you don't mind. Book of Philo on the change of names. For these men have need of the complete use of the divine name, who come to the created or more generations, in order that they in order that if they cannot attain to the best thing, they may at least arrive at the best possible name and arrange themselves in accordance with that. And the sacred oracles 
which is de delivered as from the mouth of the ruler of the universe speaks of the proper name of God, never having been revealed to anyone. When God is represented as saying, for I have not shown them my name. This is represented in Exodus 3 and 6, I mean 6 and 3. And it says, for by a slight change in the figure of speech, here use the meaning of what is said would be something of the kind. My proper name I have not revealed to them, but only that which is commonly used, though with some misapplication because of the reasons above mentioned. So we see the Most High out of the mouth of two or three witnesses never revealed his name prior to Moses. Now, this is an interesting dilemma, dilemma that we have here. No name was given. If God Almighty, known as Al Shaddai, only revealed his name to Moses at the burning bush, it raises an intriguing question. Why do names and meanings such as Judah, Jehovah Jireh, Moriah from Mount Moriah, and even Moses' own mother, Jochbed, whose name signifies Jehovah's glory or the Tetragrammaton's glory, which is represented in the Hebrew 3115, contain elements of the Tetragrammaton, YHWH. Why didn't Moses possess knowledge of the Most High's name before his encounter at the burning bush? Furthermore, what did what name did people invoke in Genesis 4 and 26? Now we'll address this question of about Genesis 4 and 26, Genesis and the name of God. Our journey to discover the truth begins with Genesis 4 and 26, as several scholars and educators suggest that this is the initial instance when the Almighty unveiled his name. Here we find then the Tetragrammaton before Moses, pages 18 and 19, or at least that's the chapter, where it is stated, Brother Najib. According to the Yahwistic tradition, the worship of Yahweh can be traced to remote antiquity. To Seth also a son was born and he called his name Enosh. At that time, when man began to call upon the name of the Lord, YHWH. And this is in Genesis chapter four, verse 26. As we can see in Genesis chapter four, verse 26, it contains a tradition that the divine name was known in antiquity. Now, when we look at um, this book, Yahweh, the divine name, it says that the divine name had a tradition of being spoken, due large part to Genesis 4 and 26. Now, we just read from out of the mouth of Josephus and Philo that the divine name or the name of the Most High had not been revealed prior to Exodus 3, 14 uh, and 15, if we go that far. And this was disseminated to us in Exodus 6 and 3 that it had not been revealed, but here we see that um, some think that it was. So the meaning of Enos, Genesis 4 and 26, and Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. We read in our King James Bibles, it's tended, we have, this is what we would see in that particular verse, is that this is when men began to call on the name of the Lord. Uh, Enos, the definition in the Hebrew 5.8.3, Enos means man, the son of Seth. Philo, that the worse is want to attack the better. And here again, we shall have no need of any other witness than Moses. For he tells us that the name of the son of Seth was Enos. And Enos being interpreted means hope. He hoped first, says Moses to call upon the name of the Lord, his God. And this is in Genesis chapter four, verse 26. On which account Moses, after he had previously mentioned with respect to Enos, that he hoped to call upon the name of the Lord, his God, adds in express words, this is the book of the generation of men. Now, according to Philo, Genesis four and 26 was to, dis to disseminate that men had hoped to call on the name of the Lord as God or to hope to call on the name of the creator. That's what they hope to do. Follow on rewards and punishments. Brother Banya. Follow on rewards and punishments. This man, the Chaldeans named Enos, but this name 
when translated into the Grecian language, means a man. He having received the common name of the whole race for his own name as an especial honor, as if it was not right for anyone to be considered as a man at all who does not hope in God. Now, when translated into the Grecian language, Enos means man. But we'll we'll dig in a little further for why we have the historian saying men had hoped, and then our regular Grecian um, translations is saying men called on the name of the Most High. So Antiquities of the Jews, 151, Josephus' perspective. It says Josephus frequently altered Hebrew names spelling them after the fashion of the Greeks to please his Greek readers. Wrote Josephus, it is the Greeks who are responsible for this change in nomenclature. Antiquity of the Jews 151. Now what does nomenclature mean? This is the definition. The devising or choosing of names for things, especially in the science or other discipline. The body of system of names in a peculiar field. Plural noun, nomenclatures, the nomenclature of chemical compounds, formal the term or terms applied to someone or something. Nomenclature. Antiquity of the Jews, 161. I have one thing to add of which the Greeks are perhaps unaware. Before reverting to the narrative where I left it, with a view to euphony and my reader's pleasures, these names having been Hellenized, the form in which they appear is not that used in our own country, where their structure and termination remain always the same. So, far, so Josephus says that in our language, in the Hebrew language, the Israelite language, the meaning of names mean the same, but they, are, they have been Hellenized in some form. So when it comes to the Greeks, they have a certain meaning, and in the Hebrew, they retain their real meaning. Definition of euphony. The effect produced by words so combined as to please the ear. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary, 1974. The Septuagint with Apocrypha, English version. Brother Najib. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. And Seth had a son, and he called his name Enos. He hoped to call on the name of the Lord God. So according to the Septuagint, according to Josephus and Philo, or Philo particularly, men had hoped to call on the name of the Lord his God. So we find no contradiction that the Most High revealed his name in Exodus 3.14 and disseminated in Exodus 6 and 3 as the first time. And then we come back here and we see that people are saying that the Most High revealed his name in Genesis. It's clear according to the translation that the proper interpretation According to the Greeks, which is what our English Bibles are translated from, is that men had hoped to call on the name of the Lord, our God. Not that they called upon his name. So let's look at Genesis 4, 26 again, given the proper context on the posterity of Cain and his exile. Brother Banya? Will subsequently have such a remedy applied to it as the case admits of? For God will raise up another offspring in the place of Abel, whom Cain slew, a male offspring for the soul which has not turned by its own intentions, by name Seth, which name being interpreted means irrigation. Looking at history, it becomes clear that our predecessors didn't perceive Genesis 4 and 26 as a direct reference to the name of the Most High. Rather, they maintained unwavering faith in the Most High and sought to invoke him. Given this insight, this now, let's now shift our focus to the importance of the land of Moriah and the idea of Jehovah Jireh. So we see that according to the ancient scriptures and the historians, that because of processes like nomenclature and euphony you know put those words in your, your you know your mental rolodex and look them up is that it helped to change hebrew words to have different meanings and even though most english translations was translated from the greek we see that the ancient greek the septuagint in particular which most of our 
modern translations come from, not, you know, not so much the Texas Reciprocus or the Latin Vulgate or any of those things, but that Genesis 4 and 26 was not a revealing of the Most High's name, but that men had hoped to call on him. Biblical analysis. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. In definition, this is from the Hebrew 7200 and the Hebrew 3050. Scene of Jah, Moriah, a hill in Palestine. Now we see, um, as we commonly read, that Mount Moriah would mean scene of Jah or Yah. Some would say Yah, Yahu was given to us in Genesis 22 and 2, that some form of the name of the Most High commonly recognized was represented in the naming of Mount Moriah. We'll continue to see if we can establish the truth on this verse. Now, biblical analysis of Genesis and the definition of uh, Je you know, Jehovah Jireh. Brother Banya? Genesis 22 and 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord it shall be seen. Definition from the Hebrew 3068 and the Hebrew 7200. Jehovah will see to it. Jehovah Jireh, a symbolic name for Mount Moriah. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. So we, again, we see that in Genesis 22 and 14 as well, that the Tetragrammaton is represented by the name Jehovah Jireh or whatever form of the Tetragrammaton one may use as being the name of the place that Abraham had took Isaac. Brother Najib, um, we'll go into the, the Book of the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible. And we'll reference to the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, page 10, commentary on Genesis chapter 22, 4Q, Genesis, Exodus A, shorts a few to be the fresh, replaces the term Yahweh in Genesis 22, 14, with the more common Hebrew term for God. Remember, the Hebraic term for God, not necessarily the word God. Thus, the familiar Jehovah Jireh becomes Elohim Jireh. Brother Najib. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him, a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abram called the name of that place God will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. Now, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was called the, the mountain of God. The place is called God will provide, or Allah Hayim, al uh, Allah or Allah will provide the Dead Sea Scrolls, page 10, commentary in between Genesis chapter 22 and 23. Brother Banya, according to the Bible itself, the name YHWH, Yahweh or Yahuwah, Yahweh or Jehovah, translated Lord in most modern editions of the Bible, was later revealed to Moses in the book of Exodus 3 and 13 and through 15. Students of the Pentateuch have long debated the use of Yahweh or Yahuwah in the book of Genesis. A common solution suggests that the early authors or editors indiscriminately used the term in his copy of the text in Genesis through Exodus. A sure to fuel the debate afresh Replace the term Yahweh in Genesis 22 and 14 with the more common Hebrew term for God. Thus, the familiar Jehovah Jireh becomes Elohim Jireh. So, you see, the Bates of the Pentateuch dealt with this issue. Why is the Tetragrammaton or any name for the Most High written into the book of Genesis? And that what is disseminated in the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible is that it is not Jehovah Jireh, but Elohim Jireh. If at all, it would make sense that how could a name be given on a mountain when the Most High had not given a name yet? Book of Philo 
on flight and finding atristes of fugitives on fugitives brother uh najit i very greatly wonder at those persons also i mean at him who is found of asking questions about what is in the middle between two extremes and who says behold the fire and the wood but where's the lamb for the burnt offering this is in genesis chapter 22 verse 7 and also at him who answers my son God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering and who afterwards find what is given as a ransom for behold, a single ram was caught by his horns in a shrub of Sebek. To him who puts these questions, answer is very properly made. God will provide for himself. Philo, God will provide for himself. Now, Isaac was 25 years old and he was building the altar. He asked his father what he was about to offer. Since there was no animal there for an oblation, to which it was answered that God will provide himself an oblation or Allahayim, he being able to make a plentiful provision for men out of what that have not or they have not and to deprive others of what they already have when they put too much trust therein. Therefore, it is God pleased to be present, present and propitious at this sacrifice. He will provide himself an oblation. He will provide himself a God will provide himself an oblation. King James Bible, uh, Brother Banya. As written in Genesis 22 and 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now the genuine transliteration of Genesis 22, 14 is God or Elohim, Elohim or Elohim will provide, um, in which a name or the tetragrammaton would be void from the book of Genesis, or particularly in this verse, 22 and 8. The Septuagint Bible English version, Brother Najee. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God tempted Abram and said to him, Abram, Abram. And he said, Lo, I am here. And he said, Take thy son, the beloved one, whom thou hast loved, Isaac, and go into the highland and offer him there for a whole burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, according to the Septuagint, and again, we'll, we'll um, establish that the Septuagint is largely the translation used for our modern Bibles. It says that the Most High told Abram to go into the high land and offer him there for a whole burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Elohim Jireh. Now, a striking contrast emerges when comparing the King James Version and the Septuagint translations of Genesis 22, 1 and 2. It becomes evident that Mount, the Mount's name was bestowed after Genesis 22, 14, not before. Thus, Mount Moriah is in truth Mount Yara, signifying, or Jireh, signifying God will provide or God sees. This alignment is substantiated by the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, the Septuagint, and notable historical accounts such as Josephus and Philo. These sources collectively affirm that the Tetragrammaton was not originally part of the name of Moriah, nor Jehovah Jireh. Is the Tetragrammaton truly in the name of Judah? Uh, Brother Banya, you don't mind? From the King James Virgin Bible, one of the primary arguments supporting the use of the Tetragrammaton involved the connection with the name of Judah, which is often interpreted as meaning YHWH is praised. Genesis 29 and 35, and she conceived again 
and bear a son. And she said, now will I praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah and left bearing. Now, I know that when I came into the truth, um, a lot of people used the name of Judah saying Yahawadah or some form of it to say that the Most High sacred name was written inside the name of Judah. But I want you guys to get your screen capture on and just take a look at some of these artifacts and then we're going to look at some things historically. Is the Tetragrammaton in the name of Judah? Brother Najib. Otto Prosk sought to discover the divine name in the first element in the name of the tribe of Judah, Yehuda. T.J. Meek, following the etymology in Genesis chapter 29, verse 35, has also claimed that the divine name appears with a form of the verb yada. But Genesis chapter 29, verse 35, provides the folk etymology. W.F. Albright comes to the conclusion that Yehuda is a passive verbal form, the haf al yada, causative equal to praise, and was originally followed by El, God. Let El be praised. The name is very ancient and is probably a pre-Mosaic tribal name. If this is the case, the Tetragrammaton is not part of the name of the tribe of Judah. Now, don't be dissuaded by the phrase to El or um, how words for God is disseminated. In the Hebraic form, whatever way that the ancient Hebrew Israelites, the ancient, ancient Israelites said God, Judah's name would be represented as God or Elohim or El Elohim or however way we want to slice it as praise. Not that the name of the Tetragrammaton would have been a form of Judah's name, according to um, this citation here. Reading the Old Testament Introduction of the Hebrew Bible by Barry L. Banstra, commonly known as the Hezekiah Seal, this Israelite artifact is dated to the reign of the Judean king Hezekiah between 716 and 686 BCE and bears an inscription in the Paleo-Hebrew script belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. The curious thing about this artifact is the spelling of the tribe of Judah is void of Tetragrammaton. We'll take a closer look at this artifact. So when we look at this, this artifact, we notice that the name of Judah is represented by Y-H-D-H or Yada, not Yahawada or Yahuda, but Yada. We can take a notice to the word Yah is being inside the name of Judah. It says, if we apply some textual criticism, further analysis of the seal provides that the name of Judah, the modern Hebraic script reads, Y-H-D-H, or Yahada, or Jada in the English, slash Yahada, according to the Hezekiah seal, and not Y-H-W-D-H, or Yehuda, or Yahawada, which establishes at least historically that the Tetragrammaton was not in the name of Judah, according to the Hezekiah seal. Yahada. Now, let's just take a look at the, the Strong's Concordance for the word for praise and what is disseminated to us inside the Browns Driver Briggs as far as the name of uh, Yehuda or Judah as we commonly know it. The Strong's and BDB Concordance for the H3068 is listed as coming from the Hebrew 3634, meaning to praise or to give thanks. This impromptu connection implies the name Judah means Yahweh or YHWH is praised. But as previously established, this notion is an impossibility in light of the fact the Almighty had not revealed a name prior to Judah's birth. And the Hezekiah seal omits the Tetragrammaton from the name of Judah. So as we look here, we see the Hebrew 3034, Yada just means praise. And it was said that I will praise the Lord or I will praise but this would be the representation of Judah's name. 
Continue, brother. Thanksgiving to the Almighty. So if you look at the time frame, and it says the Aramaic seal, 33, opposite figure dated to 550 BCE with the, ins with the inscription, Inspector of Judea. Now, 550 BCE was roughly 36 years after uh, the Babylonian or when we were taken into the Babylonian captivity. The Israelites were taken into the Babylonian captivity, predict, uh, precisely the, the southern kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, Benjamin, and Levi. And these artifacts come from that time. It says the conclusion in reading between Yahu and Yahud or Yahad began when coins that actually were marked Yahud or YHD or YHDH were found. And we look at these artifacts inside the book, the name of God, YHWH, which is pronounced as is written I A O U A. Um, and you see the artifact here where you see YHD or Yahad. We have here, it says the interesting thing about these Aramaic inscriptions is that the name of Judah appears more like YDH than YHD or YDH being the original Hebrew 3034 for praise or he is praised. So if you look at these two circles right here, we see going from right to left, Yada, Yada. You look at the other one where you see the little dots, it says Y or Yad, Da, Ha. Yada. In a lot of ways, it looks like how it actually is said inside the Hebrew 3034. Now, according to this Babylonian inscription of our coins or, uh, or our money, that the name of Judah that was taken captive into Babylon was Yada or Yahad. Yada would be the exact representation of Hebrew 3034. And we don't see the tetragrammaton in the name of Judah. As we've shown through the Hezekiah seal, the word Yah also being in uh, Exodus 3.14 as well as a shortened form, but we'll deal with that um, in a minute. But we see that the name of Judah was Yada, which specifically means praise, or you could say Yahad. Thanksgiving to the Almighty. After citing several witnesses, the name of Judah would be void of Tetragrammaton also set forth in Exodus 6 and 3, but would represent to praise with the historian Flavius Josephus stating, Brother Banya? Flavius Josephus in chapter 19 concerning Jacob's flight into Mesopotamia by reason of the fear he was in of his brothers. After him was born Judah, which denotes thanksgiving. The name of Judah, or more accurately, Yadah or Yahada meaning thanksgiving to the almighty creator of the universe. So the allegorical, allegorical interpretation in the book of Philo, uh, Brother Najib. And recommendation is employed in the two names, in that the Lord and of God. For the Lord God commanded that if a man obeyed his recommendations, he should be thought worthy of receiving benefits from God. But if he rejected his warnings, he should then be cast out to destruction by the Lord as his master and one who had authority over him. On which account, when he is driven out of paradise, Moses repeats the same names. For he says, all the Lord God sent him forth out of the paradise of happiness to till the ground from which he had been taken. This is in Genesis chapter three, verse 23. That since the Lord had laid his commands on him as his master and God as his benefactor, he might now in both these characters chastise him for having disobeyed them. But thus by the same power by which he had exhorted him, does he also banish him now that he is disobedient. Now we see that in Genesis 3 and 23, according to Philo, Lord and God, or the titles Lord and God were used as names, and that he gives specific meanings behind what Lord does as master, 
We can look up the definition to see that that's one of the definition. And God is benefactor as one who blesses and gives you all the great things that he gives to you. So when we've transcended past the name of Judah, we can see that people called on the titles as names for the most high God, according to Philo and the translations that he is disseminating to us. Allegorical interpretation in the book of Philo on dreams that are, are God sent. Brother Banya? Philo states in chapter 1, verse 163, therefore God is the name of the benefic beneficent power and Lord is the title of the royal power. So we see that these titles, God, the name of his beneficent power and Lord is the title of his royal power. And that these were, these titles were disseminated before a name was given for the most high. Continue, bro. Works of Philo, page 452, on the flight of finding. Uh, Brother Najib. The Lord was seen by Abraham, Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Means not as if the cause of all things had shown forth and become visible, but what human mind is able to contain the greatness of his appearance? But as if someone of the powers which surrounded him, that is to say, his kingly power, had presented itself to the sight for the appellation of the Lord belongs to authority, sovereignty. Now, when we look at these titles, again, we specifically talk about the Hebraic titles. Whether we say them correctly now or not is up for debate, but those titles are the titles that were used inside Genesis prior to a name being revealed. Concerning Noah's work, as a planter. Brother Banya? Moses would tell us himself, for the Lord God everlasting says he called it by its name. And this is referenced in Genesis 21 and 33. And it goes on to say, therefore the, appa the appellations already mentioned reveal the power existing in the living God. But one title is that the Lord of Lord, according to which he governs. And the other is God, according to which he is benefit, beneficent. Now, we, again, we established that these titles, which would be spiritually, uh, we can discern that these titles were exclusively used prior to a name being revealed. And there's a reason for that that men had a means or a, meth a method of calling on the most high. These titles were enforced. On the change of names, Brother Najib. But he is the God of those who are improved. As we read now, I am thy God, I am thy God, be thou increased and multiplied. And this is seen in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 also, chapter 35, verse 2. And in the case of those who are perfect, he is both together, both Lord and God. As we read in the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord thy God. This is seen in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. And in another passage, it is written, the Lord God of our fathers, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. For he thinks it right for the wicked man to be governed by a master as by a lord, that being in a state of alarm and groaning, he may have the fear of a master suspended over him. But him who is advancing in improvement, he thinks deserving to receive benefits as from God in order that by means of these benefits, he may arrive at perfection. And him who is complete and perfect he thinks should be both governed as by the Lord and benefited as by God. Particularly, we can look at the commandments. That inside the commandments, what was disseminated was the titles of the Most High and not his name was disseminated inside the commandments according to Philo. 
for it reads, it says, for in the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord thy God. Lord being the one that will punish you. God being your benefactor. That's important to understand that we use those titles in the commandments and these titles leading up to the re uh, revelation of a name that was given to Masha and the children of Israel. On dreams that they are God sent. Brother Banya. I am the God. But when the word is used incorrectly, it is put without the article, the expression being he who was seen by thee in the place, not of the God, but simply of God. And what he here calls God is his most ancient word, not having any superstitious regard to the position of the names, but only proposing one end to himself. Now, whatever the Hebraic term is, and we, we won't feel that debate on which way to articulate the word God Hebraically from two to 4,000 years ago. But we know that the word for God was his most ancient word, a universal word to denote the creator of all things. We say Allah meaning supreme God. Some say Allah El or Allah Allah just meaning God, the one who did everything, is the most ancient word and the most used generic or title that the Most High gave. And this was what was being disseminated that men will call on. So defining the titles Lord and God. Now, the Hebraic titles for Lord and God in its most simplistic meaning are as follows. Looking at your Browns, Driver Briggs, and Strong's Concordance definition, we have Lord. One is which is don, a don, just means Lord. From the unused root, meaning to rule, sovereign, that is controller, human, divine, Lord, master, owner. Compare names beginning with Adon or Adonai, which is the Hebrew 136. Then we have Adonai, which is usually pronounced by modern society. We would say Adanya, which means my Lord, which is the Hebrew 113 or from the 113. The Lord is a proper name of God only, my Lord, or one using my Lord instead of using a name. Now, for God, we would have L or O being A-L, which would be strength, adjective, mighty, especially the almighty, but used as of any deity, all being or L meaning singular God, one God, God or God, goodly, great, idol, might, um, power, strong. And then we have uh a mix between Allawa and Allah. Allah just means singular God. Allahayim, the supreme God. The illusionist deception. Strong's definitions highlight Hebraic titles such as Lord and God, notably Adonai and Elohim. These titles are vital for understanding references to the Most High from Genesis to Exodus 3.14. Historical sources, including Philo Judea, support the use of these titles over the Tetragrammaton. They are prominent in passages like Genesis 3, 23, 17, 1, 21, 33, and 35, and 2, and Deuteronomy 4 and 1, and even in the Ten Commandments or the Commandments at Exodus 22. Philo elaborates on these Hebraic titles, Lord, Adon, and God, or all Allah, or Allah along with the exceptions like the Most High, Ayawan, and God Almighty, al -Shaddai. While we may not pronounce or write these titles precisely as they were in ancient times, they, they represent the universal names used by people to invoke the creator and author of the universe. Now, these titles are not a bad word. These titles were great titles that was given if you were just to call on the one who created you. Literacy transforming from verb to noun grammatically what comprise the name of god now we'll get into the actual name so the name of the most high has four letters as stated by our historians uh brother najib and above this citrus is a golden leaf on which an engraving of four letters was impressed by which letters they say that the name of the living God is indicated, since it is not possible that anything 
that it in existence should exist without God being invoked. For it is his goodness and his power combined with mercy that is the harmony and unitor of all things. Four letters. Let's remember that. And works of Josephus, the War of the Jews, or well, the History of the Destruction of Jerusalem, Book 5, Chapter 5, uh, the Description of the Temple. Brother Banya. A mean tree also of fine linen encompasses head, which was tied by a blue ribbon, about which there was another golden crown, in which was engraven the sacred name of God. It consists of four vows. Now, I know we've been taught that the Hebrew language doesn't have vowels, or, but we do have vowel sounds. And we see consistently that the name of the Most High was represented by four letters. And we, we did go back to the definition of te tetragrammaton, a tetragram, a tetragraph, which means any group of four letters. Any group of four letters is a tetragrammaton. Go ahead. Continue, bro. So four vowels. Josephus speaks of phoneta sounds this which comes from the greek which is translated into vowels because a consonant which means in latin with a sound needs a sound to be pronounced now we're looking at a citation out of the book the name of god yhwh western dictionary phonetics the study and classification of speech or sounds and the third tetragrammaton often abbreviated as Tetragram or tetragram typically denotes a set of four letters that symbolize sounds, which may not necessarily align with the individual letter sounds. Continue, bro. So we'll take a look back at Exodus 3, 14, 15, the name of the Almighty. Brother Banya. Exodus 3 and 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. Moving forward with Exodus 3 and 15. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Now, the name of the Most High has four letters as stated by our historians, which um, a lot of, most of you probably already knew. Both the name written in Exodus 3.14, which is something that we don't acknowledge, I am, which is Aleph Ha Yaha. In Hebrew, you see those letters in Hebrew or the Hebrew 1961. And the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, represented by the Hebrew 3068, they both consist of four letters. The name that was given to Moses in Exodus 3.14 and the one we commonly uh, refer the Most High's name to in Exodus 3.15, both consist of four letters when spoken by the Most High about Exodus 3.14. But the Strong's Concordance number, Hebrew 1961, is rendered as Y or H Y H or Haya, meaning it making it three letters. Now, why is that? Why is the Hebrew letter Aleph missing as written in Exodus 3:14? And what is the contextual relevance? So, how do we get from a verb to a noun? Which is a common argument that the Hebrew 1961 or what they see as Haya is a verb and could not possibly denote a name. It says the Strong's Concordance numbers, Hebrew 589 and Hebrew 595 denote I. If you were to actually go into uh, chat GPT and look up what does I am mean in Hebrew, it would say Anai, Anai or Anake, just meaning I. Um, that is symbolized by the Hebrew letter Aleph in Exodus 3.14. Has the utmost significance and is the difference between the Hebrew 1961 becoming a verb or a noun? A noun in a, place in, a person, place, or thing. The Hebrew 595, which would be pronounced ane or ane, contracted from the Hebrew 595 means I. 
me, mine, myself, we, um, the BDB definition being the first person singular, singular, usually used for emphasis. And we also have the Hebrew 595, which is anake, which means I, me, which, which is the first person singular. So this letter I um, is represented by the Aleph when we look at Exodus 314, taking the verb Y, me, H, Y, H, and placing the olive in front of it, meaning I am, or at least that's how it's translated. Um, we continue. The name of the Most High has four letters. Now, prefix to the noun, or prefix to noun. The Strong's H59 or the 595 represented the letter I is the prefix to the Hebrew 1961, making Haya Ahaya, which is Aleph Hayadha, I am, as um, is commonly transliterated to us. As written in Exodus 3.14 is the first person singular form when the Almighty makes it a name for himself, thus making the verb to be, represented by the Hebrew 1961 or HYH, into a noun and the appellation that the Almighty spoke to Moses of Masha, which is represented as Aleph Ha Yad Ha. Here are some examples starting in Exodus 3.12, 4.12, and 4.15, because we've been told that the Most High never uses that name formation again. But let's look at the text. Exodus 4.12 and 15. You can go to the Hebrew Old Testament.com if you want to follow along to look at the text. That way you can um, see for yourself if we are um, accurately representing what's written there. In Exodus 4 and 12 and 15, most English translations of the Bible have phrased, I will be, to disseminate a verb when the Almighty speaks to Moses prior to sending him to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Taking a closer look at the modern Hebrew and Paleo scripts, we see that the same name is given to Moses, I am, which is Aleph Ha Yad Ha, prefixed by the word Anake, which means I. Historical references will agree with our assessment on the aforementioned verses. Why did the, the, you know, the ancient translators or the translators of the Bible decide to put I am? Because they, rep they, they looked at this word I in the Hebrew, which is Anake. Brother Bonnie, if you can just go to the orange highlight at the top. That word anake is preceding the exact phrase or name that the Most High gave to Moses in Exodus 3.14. But the translation says, now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth, as if you're looking at the verb H-Y-H, -H, and, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now, if we would look at the, the text and read it how it was read in Exodus 3.14, it would say, now therefore go in the higher with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. These are the exact, the exact way and phrase that the Most High used in Exodus 3.14 is the exact way it was said to Moses in Exodus 4 and 12. We see the same inside verse 15. You can slide over to the right, brother. You see Anake again, denoting the first person singular prior to going to what is supposed to be a verb. And it reads, and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what she shall say. Now, looking at I will be will look like a verb. But if it is written exactly how it was written in Exodus 3.14 as spelled Aleph Hayadha, which is also a tetragrammaton, it would read that Ahaya with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what she shall say. The most high disseminated disseminated the same letter formation in Exodus 3, 14, when he said to Moses, when you go to the children of Israel, say, I am sent, to, sent me unto you. The word anake preceding the verb. Now, do we just know this on our own, or, or do is there some general knowledge of this being in the text? Order in History by Eric Volgan, originally published in 1956. Brother Najid, if you don't mind. In the framing passages of the Thornbush episode, chapter 3, verse 12, and chapter 4, verse 12, the Eye 
has the meaning, I will be with you. And the Chicago translation justly paraphrases the AA in chapter 4, verse 12 as, I will help you, though the paraphrase destroys the structure of the text. The meaning that God will be present as the helper, furthermore, is confirmed by the instruction to Moses to tell the people, Aye has sent me to you, chapter 3, verse 14. The passage would have to be paraphrased, the one who is present as your helper has sent me to you. In the light of this meaning supported by the prophecy of Hosea must be understood the central Aye. Asha Eye, usually translated as I am who I am, unless we introduce extraneous philosophical categories, the text can only mean that God reveals himself as the one who is present as the helper. The one that is present. Then you. Now, the canonical Hebrew Bible, a theology of the Old Testament by Rolf Rentorf of 2005, uh, Brother Banya. Page 204. Ability to speak plays a significant part with Isaiah and Ezekiel too. Isaiah 6, 5 through 7, Ezekiel 172 and 235. God's somewhat ill-tempered answer sound like his answer to jeremiah now therefore go and i will be once again the ayah of 3 12 and 14 with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak now according to biblical theology now therefore go and i will be is the translation that been given down or passed down but is recognized as Aya or the name given, or at least it was phrased in Exodus 3.12, but as a name given in Exodus 3.14, with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. The understanding that this, the name that was given in Exodus 3.14 was never spoken again is not disseminated here, but that the most high and cru crucial junctures in the text actually uses the name that he told Moses to tell to the children of Israel, the Israel was used again and it was used in that context. Continue. Bro. The Almighty shall teach you what to say. Now, the Almighty says, Aleph Ha Yaha, Aleph He Yad He. Um, most scripts break it down as Ea. We will say, most high have mercy on us and we'll be speaking in this proper context as we know it to be, which would be a higher. Um, the olive being in front of the verb being I am, or that's how it was translated to us, representing the most high's ever presence with the mouth of Moses and Aaron. And he will teach Moses and Aaron what they shall do. The same is articulated in the Gospels. Gospels. Uh, reference Luke chapter 12, 11 and 12 regarding the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKadosh, which in the spirit of the Almighty, Brother Banya. Luke 12 and 11. And when they bring you into the synagogue and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how to what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. Luke 12 and 12. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what he ought to say. Similar phraseology as in the Exodus 3.14, Exodus 4.12, Exodus 4.15. Continue, bro. Now, obviously we can see it's contextually similar. The parallels between Exodus 4.12.15 and Luke 12.11 and 12 are contextually evident to have the same or at the very least similar meanings. Brother Najee, the Niger Delta from the slave trade to the oil rivers to crude oil, edited by T.I. Okari and Kingsley C. Najaku. James Plasteris, author, page 124. 
The Septuagint's translation of AA as being, ego, I aim, hold on, I am the one who is, substantially changes the meaning of the Hebrew text in some subsequent translations. On page 136, 88, he nevertheless insists that whatever, excuse me, that whenever the word aye was used in the Hebrew, it usually expresses a dynamic rather than an essential sense of existence. Plasteris argues that the Septuagint and Latin translation changed the meaning of the Hebrew text by aye in terms of essential being rather than an active presence. The Most High is showing his active presence when he says to Moses, I am. His active presence, as in, I'm always with you. Continue. Now, in the Hebrew 595, meaning anake, meaning means I. I will be is a statement and is not the same as denoting an appellation when read Aleph Ha Yad Ha, which is represented by the Aleph, the He, the Yad, the He. With thy mouth. It's totally different to say, I will be or when the Most High denotes the presence of a name with thy mouth, Exodus 4.12 and 4.15, are in perfect alignment with Exodus 3.14. If Exodus 3.12 and 4.15 was read, read Ahia with thy mouth, the same way the Most High says, when you speak to the children of Israel in Exodus 3.14, speaking his name and saying that this is what you should tell the children of Israel, will have a profound impact on how we view these verses. But it was chosen to be disseminated as a verb, not looking at the fact that we have the I or the Anake that precedes the word, and it is exactly four letters in this context in the name that the Most High gave in Exodus 3.14. Ever-present. The phrase I will be, as we have articulated, Aleph, Hey, Yad, Hey, in Exodus 3, 12, elucidates the significance of the name chosen by the Almighty, signifying he is constant presence. He pervades the heavens and the earth, differentiating himself as the ever-present God, or Allah Hayyam, or Elohim, not distant or elsewhere, but consistently at hand. He reassures, I am with you, always, everywhere at once guaranteeing success now that the worse is want to attack the better looking at the book of philo brother banya for virtue the virtues of god are founded in truth existing according to his essence since god alone exists in essence on account of which fact he speaks of necessity about himself saying I am that I am. This is referenced in Exodus 3 and 14. As if those who were with him did not exist according to essence, but only appeared to exist in opinion. So Philo disseminates that by most high saying I am that I am, that is always present. Like this is his essence, that I am everywhere at once filling the heavens and the earth. Now, he says this is his opinion, but I'm pretty sure that we can come to the conclusion that this is not an opinion, but a fact that the Most High fills the heavens and the earth and is never not present. I am everywhere. So let's look at, we have an analysis on Psalms 50 and 21. And as we can see, the translators erroneously rendered the Hebrew 1961, which appears back to back as that I was all together. But in fact, the name of the Almighty is spoken in admonishment. In Psalms 50 and 21, it is important to highlight not only the textual context, but also the translation of Aleph Ha Yad Ha and Ha Ya Wa Kap, as that, or you see the lettering formation that I was 19, and it uses both the Hebrew 1961 together back to back to say that I was all together. We take notice that the Hebrew 1961 is, is not exclusively represented by the Hebrew letters H-Y-H, -H, or Hayah. 
Haya or HYH, but also can be represented by different lettering formations. In this situation, we have Haya Wakath. It is of great importance to note Psalms 5021 implicates the Almighty spoke of himself by the name given to Moses, which we already articulated that is commonly given to us as Aya, which is Aleph Ha Yadha at the burning bush, citing the commentary of the book of Psalms, volume two. And we'll look at this verse real quick. And it says, Psalms 50 and 21, these things has, if you read it, how it says, Ahia, which would be Ahira, it says, thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thought of that I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. So the name that was given to Moses said, I will reprove thee, that Ahiah will reprove thee. Because when he said, such as one as thyself, y'all thought he was one as thyself, Ahiah was not such as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. So the name was given to Moses was specifically put there to, to set a difference between the most high and the things that the nations were doing that they thought that he was well to do with. Again, another instance where it's disseminated the same way was given to Moses, the same way. Now, are we the only ones that notice this in the text? Commentary of the Book of Psalms, Volume 2, author James Anderson. Um, Brother Banya? Uh, verse 21. These things have thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I would be like thyself. I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Horsley translates these two clauses as follows. These things thou hast done, and I was still. Thou hast thought that I am is such as one as thyself. It goes on to say, he thinks that the words me, Hayoth, Ehia, which Calvin renders, I would be, have been misunderstood by all interpreters and maintain that they should be rendered, I am, is. All interpreters say he seems to have forgotten that Ehia is the name which, the, which God takes to himself in the third chapter of Exodus, and he observes that it is with particular pros prosperity that God in expulation, ex expulation with his people for their breach of covenant, calls himself by the name by which he was pleased to describe himself to that same people. When he first called them by his servant Moses. The, the LXX rendered Hayoth as a noun substantive and Ehya as the first person, future of this substantive verb. Thou thoughtest wickedly, and I should be like thee. So we're looking in the commentary of the book of Psalms that the I am, according to the rendering, was not given into account that the Most High had, this is the same name that he had given for himself. And that according to the commentary in this particular book, it's in a disagreement with that it was translated to just, I will be that I will be, or you thought that I was altogether thyself, where the Most High is denoting his, his ever presence, the name that he gave to Moses saying, you thought that my name was altogether as thyself. Which the, he goes on to say, thou thought of wickedly that I should be like thee. Hosea 1 and 9. Now, as previously mentioned, the Most High conveyed his presence to Moses, guiding him in his speech. Now we will delve into the implications of the Most High's absence, especially when he withdraws his name, a theme addressed in the book of Hosea, where we also see inside the verse here says, Then said God, call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. 
But is that exactly what he said? If we were going to the text, we see Anake. If you can go to the highlight, brother, the top highlight. You see Anake in connection to the word or the name given to Moses in Exodus 3.14. And it stands saying, I will not be your God. It says, Ahiah, not your God, or Aya, not your God. Now, the impact of the Most High withdrawing his name is of particular insignificance because I, it's a, I will not be leaves of who there, who will not be. But if the Most High denotes the name he gave to Moses, he's telling you exactly who will not be your God, which is exactly what was disseminated to the northern kingdom of the Israelites. According to the text, if you were going to HebrewOldTestament.com, just to look at the wording, the word. The four-letter word that the Most High gave to Masha in Exodus 3.14 is exactly what's disseminated here. Continue, bro. Are we the only ones who notice this as well? I say not. If you go into the Anchor Bible, volume 25, part 2, uh, 1987 translation, uh, Brother Najib. I will be for her, literally, and I, I will be for her. Wa'ani eye la. The use of the verb to be, H Y H, with God as speaker, followed by a preposition with a pronominal suffix, is suggestive of the use of the divine name Eye. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, the sequence H Y H. Well, uh, like him, excuse me, sent me to you is related to the revelation of God's name. Hosea chapter one, verse nine has a similar structure. Um, it has a similar structure, excuse me. Um, and this is uh, seen in the Anderson and Freeman uh, 1980 through 143. Um, and 198 through 99. Translate the Hosea passage, and I am not AA to you. Now, according to, in, in this book particularly, if you see the highlighted yellow words there, is to represent Anake. And Anake, or N-I, you see the, the letters P-H-Y-H was to represent what they're saying is AA or as a higher. Um, we're being very tactful with how we approach the name that the Most High gave to Moses. Um, that lettering formation is to let you know that the Anake preceded the verb, placing the I in front of the verb, or Aleph Hayadha. When it's used that way, it's no longer a verb. It's no longer just um, a happenstance phrase, but that the Most High is calling unique attention to his presence. You continue, bro. Journal of Biblical Literature, volume 104, 1985. Brother Banya. Page 14. He said, call his, call his name Loami, for you are not my people, and I am not yet here to you. Anderson Freeman, and the Lord said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people. Page 17, Wolf goes on to say that the use of Ehia makes the meaning of the Tetragrammaton more easily heard than Yahweh. 18 Ishbel expand, expands on that idea by asserting that at that one moment, if never again, Jose employed in a chilling way to assert that God had abandoned Israel. 19, thus it is felt that the significant theological statement is being made. Now, what's interesting that Wolf goes on to say the use of AA or the proper name that we've given makes the meaning of the Tetragrammaton more easily heard than using the word Yahweh. That the name that was given in Exodus 3.14 saying I am or my presence or the name that he presented is no longer with you. 
Not I will be like I'm withdrawing myself, but my name, who I am, is no longer with you. And he goes on to use poetic words saying that this has a chilling way to assert that God had abandoned Israel. This is what was articulated to the northern kingdom, that the father, Ahaya, is not with you. Down that is a raise to divorce, as we have, you know, you've seen in the book of Jeremiah regarding the northern kingdom when the most high had put away the northern kingdom for a time. Continue. Order in history. Brother Najib. There is extant an interesting text in the prophecies of Hosea, which proved beyond a doubt that this was indeed the sense in which the Israelites themselves understood the formulas of the Thornbush episode. The God who had disclosed himself as present could also withdraw, and then he would be no longer the I will be with you, and the people would be no longer my people. The prophet knew that the separation was already in process and would be consummated by disaster in pragmatic history. Continue, bro. Brother Bun. Order in history. So the revelation of Hosea embraced the actual dissolution of the people, accompanied by the external destruction of the northern kingdom. In order now to bring the divine foreknowledge to the knowledge of the people, Hosea chose the method of giving his son a symbolic name in one and nine. And he, Yahweh said, call his name Laami, not my people, for you are not my people, Lo Ami, and I, not I am, Lo Ehya, to you. The text is important in that it proves not only the role of the symbolic, the symbolism in the constitution of the Israelites, theolopal, the Theopolite, but also the existence of the formulas in the middle of the 8th century. Now, looking according to the 8th century, at this time, you can see that the Most High used the same phrase again inside Exodus 3.14, that this is not just something that um, the salt of the earth noticed in the text, but that those who call themselves biblical scholars, theologians, um, critics of the text. Notice also that the Most High used the same lettering or name uh, phraseology as we commonly call it, or they call it Ea, is his name again when he withdrew himself from Hosea. This is not something that we noticed on our own, but that is actually in the text and that there have been books written about, or at least uh, some information disseminated about this event. So Jose inside your Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges. And uh, we use this as our witness here again. Lomi mean not my people. Observe the climax in names. Jezreel announces the judgment. Loruma, the with, withdrawal, but they use the word Jehovah's affection. Loami, the treatment of Israel as a foreign people. I will not be your God. I will not be for or to you, perhaps on your side. Or as proof, Robertson Smith, I am no longer Aya, alluding to Exodus 3.14. And God said to Moses, I will be that which I will be, what I have promised and you look for. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I will be, or Aya, which we disseminate as Ahaya, have sent me unto you. According to this view, Aya is the equivalent to Yahya or Yeya or whatever is a more correct form of the name miswritten Jehovah, the revealed name of Israel's God and Hosea 1.9 is the earliest witness of the true meaning of Exodus 3.14. I am, I am no longer a for you. Now, 
inside the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges in the book about the book of Hosea says correct was the miswritten Jehovah or miswritten test tetragrammaton. Continue, bro. Olive Ha Yadha, the father witnesses, even looking at the context of this particular verse, you will see a different understanding, even more important to what the Mosai is actually trying to say to us. It says the authentic context of Olive Ha Yadha or Ahaya signifies his father, and he shall be my son, as mentioned earlier. The Hebrew 1961 is transliterated in diverse forms, such as in 2 Samuel 7, 14, where Yahya denotes shall be rendered as Yahe, Yahe. But if we would go to the text to the right side of the banya, you notice that it says Ane, representing I, that preceded the verb, making the verb into a four-letter word, Aleph, He, Yad, He. And if you look at the context of the verse, is saying, Ahia be his father, and he shall be my son. If committed iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. So the, the notion here is that the same way the Most High spoke to Moses in Exodus 3.14, we see that the Most High literally says his name being the father and Solomon being his son in 2 Samuel 7.14. A higher will be his, his father, and he shall be my son. Translated also as Ai. Now, this should change the impact of some of these verses that these are things we had not known, that we didn't know that were even there. That the Most High had said his name in the same way he spoke it to Moses. Continue, bro. So to confirm, confirm that we are not merely revising translation, but rather illuminating the name the Almighty conveyed to Moses in Exodus 3.14, is it essential to note that the Almighty referred to himself in a similar fashion in other passages in the Bible. These instances were translated to convey a common verb, yet in truth, his divine abolition is inscribed. This is not our, our just our translation or mistranslating or trying to retranslate the text but that to show historical proofs and citations that these things were noticed in the text and we just given, it was just given to us as just a verb being spoken, not without the textual context of it, of saying that the ane or the anake preceded the verb and that it was the same lettering formation, the same emphasis that the Most High gave to Masha in Exodus 3.14. Now, what does it say in the book of Jeremiah? Also said in the book of uh, Exodus, I believe, 19 and 15, I believe. Obey my voice, uh, Brother Najib. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 22. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 23. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. Now, the Most High said, obey his voice. And if we just did that small thing, we just obeyed his voice without having to have any hyperbole come along or anybody say, well, this means, or change, change the text or change anything that he says, we would be on the path of straightness. We would be on a straight path just by obeying his voice. But we make, we let people come along and introduce things to us that the text is actually trying to help us what to rule out, what to acknowledge as what the Most High said when he says a particular thing, when he says I am, when he says to do a thing. This is what he means. He shouldn't be able to be explained away. Obey my voice. Remember that. What did he say, Brother Banya? The Most High said, obey my voice. 
and the law by the prophets Jeremiah. So what did the Almighty say his name is? Witness of the antiquity wrote extensively on the name of the Almighty and states the only proper name given when addressing Exodus 3 and 14 through 3 and 15. Brother Najib. On Abraham, Young's titles, the treatise, excuse me, the treatise on the life of the wise man made perfect by instruction or on the unwritten law, that is to say, on Abraham. The one in the middle is the father of the universe, who in the sacred scriptures is called by his proper name, I am that I am. Now, according to Philo, the proper name of the Most High is I am that I am, represented by the Hebrew characters of Ahia Ashar Ahia. Philo disseminates is the proper name, at least that he knows of. Philo living over 2,000 years ago during the Second Temple period prior to the sacking of Jerusalem. Brother Najib. Ancient book of Gad the seer referenced in First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29. And the one dressed in linen came down to me and touched me saying, write these words and seal them with the seal of truth. For I am who I am is my name. And with my name, you shall bless the whole house of Israel, for they are the true seed. According to Gad the seer, the same as written in Exodus 3.14 is written here. Continue, bro. Brother Banya. Historically speaking, the 11th edition in the Second Peter Britannica on page 312. Theodoret, born in Antioch, writes that the Samaritans pronounced the name I.B. in another passage, Abu. The Jews, Ea. The latter is probably not J.H.V.H., but Ehia, Exodus 3 and 14, which the Jews counted among the names of God. There is no reason whatsoever to imagine that the Samaritans pronounced the name J-H-V-H differently from the Jews. Now, according to the Cyclopedia Britannica, theoret, a theoret, theoret of, you could say, um, after the death or A.D. 457, who was living in Antioch, he says that the Samaritans pronounce what would be commonly called the Tetragrammaton or Ibe or another picture passage, Ibue, the Jews say Aye. The latter is probably not J H V H, but Aya. So the Jew, the Jews used the name that was written in Exodus 3:14. But the Samaritans used a form of the Tetragrammaton. The Jewish Encyclopedia.com, Brother Najib. The oldest exegetes, such as Anclius and the Targumen of Jerusalem and Pseudo Jonathan, regard Aye and Aye Asha Aye as the name of the divinity and accept the etymology of Haya to be. which you can read in your Jewish encyclopedia. Continue, bro.
you know, ego of me. Some would say ego of me, Hoan, which was written inside the Septuagint to disseminate I am that I am. I'd like to point out one small difference is that inside the Greek, you see ego of me, Hoan, meaning I am that I am. And the Greeks make a difference between the I am of Hoan and the I am of ego of me. But in the Hebrew, we just have a show, I mean, a higher, a show, a higher. There is no difference in the phraseology in the words, but the Greeks make that that's make a different change. Brother uh, Banya. Twice when Christ proclaims I am, paralleling Moses and the priests react, react by preparing to stone him. Yet they later prostrate themselves in reverence upon hearing the name, I am. In the King James Version Bible, John 8 and 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am, ego and me. John 8 and 59, then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, obviously, the, these words wasn't disseminated in the Greek at all, but the Mashiach, whom they call Jesus, um, whom we call Yeshia or Yeshai, spoke Hebraically. And when he said, I am, they picked up stones to stone him, because this would be a heresy to just speak the name of the Most High, uh, un just, 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 just to speak it outright, which we will get to. Continue. John 18 and 6, as soon as they had, as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Now, I am, which is spoken by the Mashiach or Christ, in the Greek is ego and me. Ancient Greek letters, I am, which is in contrast to I am in Exodus 3.14 in the Septuagint. The Septuagint, Exodus 3, 14, and God spoke to Moses saying, I am, or ego I me, mind you, that is the translation in the Septuagint, but you got to remember it's a Hebraic word um, that is being disseminated in Greek, and we see as far as the use of nomenclature and euphony, and uh, the statement that Josephus made about how the Greek changes the language. So when the Septuagint is rendered as the being, and he said, thus shall ye say to the children of Israel, Aleph Yadha." The being has sent me unto you. Now we read in Genesis, I mean John 17 and 26, which is in the Gospels, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now we ask, what was declared by Christ or the Mishap? What name did he declare? And we see the instances, um, and we'll just speak historically. The Tetragrammaton is not was not in the Gospels. But the name that was given respect and reverence to was I am Hebraically. Um, just looking at the words ego and me was just what the Greek translators did. Brother Najee, the Kabbalah Code, a true adventure, page 36. That was the name I am that I am. Well, this is where it gets interest, interesting, Philo said. A.A. Asha A.A. was only one name given to Moses by way of an introduction. Immediately after God said A.A. Asha A.A., which in standard Mosaic text is translated as I am that I am, God said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, this is the true name of God, at least from this perspective of the angel of the Lord, whom God chose to speak to. Now, according to the Kabbalah Code, they, re they recognize that I am has sent me to you. Now, this is the true name of God. And it says, at least from the perspective of the angel of the Lord, who actually spoke these things to Moses, that this would be the name of the Most High. Now, we're looking at a matter of perspective. If to the to the angel of the most high, if his name is I am, 
why is it not I am to us? Continue. The American Journal of Semitic Languages and Literatures, page 255 of the Banya. Verse 14 and 15, in reference of Exodus 3 and 14 to 15, present a difficult problem. Yet one which is in view of its difficulty has been answered. Incorrectly, we believe, by biblical scholars with surprising anonymity, in verse 13, Moses has put to the deity the question as to his name. Verses 14 and 15 offer the answer to this question. The difficulty is that the answer is double. Verse 15 furnishes an answer to the question of 13 as complete and logical as that of 14. And the difficulty is heightened by the fact that the two answers do not agree. For 14 states explicitly that the name of the deity is Ehia, while 15 states just as explicitly that the name is Yahweh or Tentagrammaton, which is original, which is original. And after determining this, how should we account for the second answer? With surprising anonymity, as has been said, scholars have agreed that 14 is the original. Now, if you look back at the American Journal of Semitic Languages, it says that for 14 states, explicitly that the name of the deity is AA, while 15 states, the Tetragrammaton. Now, I was asking, what is the, which is the original? And after determining this, and this is a the scholarly debate, how shall we account for the second answer? And the author of the book goes on to say, with surprising unanimity, or as he, as has been said, scholars agree that 14 is the original. That scholars agree that 14 is the original answer to the question of what the Most High's name is. With surprising un unanimity. Continue. The American Journal of Semitic Languages, Brother Najib. Most scholars completely to overlook the fact that 15 offers a second answer to the question and to assume without argument that 14 is the only original answer. As Marty has correctly pointed out, the name of the deity given in 14 is not Ea Asha Ea, but only Ea alone. Verse 14b states explicitly that when Moses comes to the children of Israel and they ask who has sent him, he is to answer, A has sent me unto you. We must therefore interpret A, say A, not in the usual meaningless manner. I am that I am, but with Marty, A, -A that is I am. In other words, the, for, the verse implies that the proper name of the deity, Aye, not only specifies him as an individual, but also sets forth a fundamental attribute as the one who is, presumably, therefore, as the externally existent one. Now, I know we're not privy to these arguments, but it says that 14 is the only original answer to, to scholars, given the text. So it says the verse implies that the proper name of the deity, as he has said, is Aya, not only specifies him as an individual, but also sets forth his fundamental attribute, the one who is presumably, therefore, the ex external existent one. And it said that this name, this name, but only Aya alone, that was the only name given alone, without any cousins or brothers or anything to attach to it, but alone that this was given and that scholars have debated this question. Continue. The Great Angel, Study of Israel's Second God, according, which is a book by Margaret Baker. Um, Brother Banya. The self-revelation of Memra has been the subject of considerable debate. 
since what revealed is not the name by which he is addressed, Yahweh, he who is, he who causes to be, but rather the personal form by which he reveals himself, Ehya, I who and who calls to exist. The, the Palestinian Targums hint at the significance of this self-revelation in their translation of Ehya, Asha Ehya, in the RSV of Exodus 3 and 14, renders this I am who I am and T-O leaves the name untranslated, whereas the Palestinian Targums show that Ehya Asha Ehya was associated with creation, both past and present. The first Ehya refers to the past and the second to the future, showing the continuous creative power. I am he who is and who will be, have not have sent me unto you. TP's J Exodus 14, he who spake to the world be, and it is and it was, and who will speak to it be and it will be ft to exodus 3 and 14 he who said and the world was from the beginning and is to say again to it be and it will be tn to exodus 3 and 14 the name by which his people addressed him was yahweh whereas the name by which he revealed his own presence was Ehia. Whereas the name which was revealed by his own presence was Ehia, which is we obey the Most High's voice. These are the words disseminated to Masha. Continue, bro. So Ephra's translation of Palestinian Targums on the book of Shemuf of Exodus, the section of the law titled Shemuf 314. Brother Najib. And Moshe said before the Lord, behold, I will go to the sons of Israel and say to them, the Lord of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they will say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And the Lord said unto Moshe, he who spake, and the world was, who spake, and all things were. And he said, this thou shalt say to the sons of Israel, I am he who is, and who will be, has sent me unto you. And the word of the Lord said to Moshe, he who spake to the world, be, and it was, and who will speak to it, be, and it will be. And he said, Thus shalt thou speak to the sons of Israel. Aye has sent me unto you. Clearly, the Mosai says, Aye, at least uh, according to the English, has sent me unto you. Continue. So we're talking about exclusivity. Clearly, historically and scripturally, the Almighty exclusively spoke the name found in Exodus 3.14 or Shemuth. We provided evidence of the Almighty's use of this name in significant scripture passages, often overlooked by mainstream figures in theology, history, and archaeology. Now let's look at Exodus 3.15, Exodus 3.15 decoded, because if the Most High exclusively spoke his name in Exodus 3.14, then why would the Tetragrammaton be disseminated in Exodus 3.15? Exodus 3.15 is universally known as the Declaration of the Tetragrammaton. We've also established that the name given in Exodus 3.14 is a Tetragrammaton as well, Aleph Ha Yad Ha, which is four letters. However, historic records of antiquity show a different understanding of this verse. Titles such as God and Lord, as previously established, were in fact words used where the tetragrammaton is represented in capital letters. 
which is capital L-O-R-D. Now we will establish the full context of Exodus 3.15. We'll go back to the Targums, the Ephraim's translation of the Palestinian Targums. And we'll read that the Lord said again unto Moshe, Thus shalt thou speak to the sons of Israel, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, or Jacob, have sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is his memorial to every generation and generation. Brother Najib, the Dragunic edition of the Chamash Hamisha of the Torah. God said unto Moshe, Aye, Hasha, Aye, that I will be what I will be. And he said, So shall ye say to the children of Israel, Aye, I will be, has sent me to you. God also said to Moshe, So shall you say to the children of Israel, God, the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yesak, the God of Yacob, has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, and this is how I should be recalled in every generation. Now, in this translation of Exodus 3.15, it says, God also said unto Moses, so shall say to the children of God, the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Yeshak, the God of Yacob, have sent me unto you. This is my eternal name. This is how I should be recalled in every generation, particularly emphasized in Exodus 3.14. But in this particular verse, we see that the Most High just doubled down that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living and not the dead. Continue. So it says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Brother Banya. For having added his own peculiar name to their names, he has united them together, appropriating, appropriating to himself in a, an appellation composed of the three names. For say, God, this is my everlasting name. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, referenced in Exodus 3 and 15. Using there the relative term instead of the absolute one, and this is very natural, for God stands in no need of name. But though he does not stand in any such need, nevertheless he bestows his own title on the human race, that they may have a, ref a refuge to which to betake themselves in supplication and prayer, and so may not be destitute of a good hope. And when we look at Philo's dissemination of Exodus 3.15, it's important we know it says, for having added his own peculiar name to their names, it says the Most High added his name to the names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he goes on to elaborate. Now we're looking at Exodus 3.15 in the eyes of Philo has united them together. He had united his name and the, the names of his chosen, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to his name. It says, for appropriating himself an appellation imposed of the three names. For says God, this is my everlasting name. I am, which is represented by Ia or Ahaya, which is what we pronounce the Most High's name to be, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The Most High connecting his name to who he is the God of as disseminated by Philo and which would be represented in Exodus 3.15. Continue. On the life of Moses, one, the trustees of the life of Moses, that is to say on the theology and prophetic offices of Moses, book one. Brother Najee. If then they ask, what is the name of him who sent thee? And if I know not what to reply to them, shall I not seem to be deceiving them? 
And God said, at first say unto them, I am that I am, that when they have learnt that there is a difference between him that is and him that is not, they may be further taught that there is no name, whatever that can properly be assigned to me, who am the only being to whom existence belongs. And if inasmuch as they are weak in their natural abilities, they shall inquire further about my appellation. Tell them not only this one fact that I am God, but also that I am the God of those men who have derived their names from virtue, that I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. It is further disseminated that the Most High, as we read from the book of Philo, and if inasmuch they are weak in their natural abilities, for first we should also know that there's no name properly that can be ascribed to the Most High. Men are given names, oftentimes according to attribute and mission, or just by a sweet sound to their parents. But a, the Most High himself cannot be named, but we would have come to an if they give us a name. It would be the God that is always present. It says, they shall inquire further about my appellation. Tell them not only this one fact that I am God, but also that I am the God of those men who have derived their names from virtue, that I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Of course, the translation of I am is just what has been given to us. But in a lot of ways, it's actually suiting to say that if I'm worshiping the most high, He's the one who's saying, I am always present. I am always the one who is doing, acting. I'm always the one who is blessing. I'm always the one who is saving. Continue, bro. Page 17, 18, Eusebius of Classical History. Again, we're looking at Exodus 3.15. A summary of the view of the pre-existence divinity of our Lord and Savior, whom they say Jesus Christ, and Shah HaMashiach. Uh, the Banya. Page 17. Here then you will perceive from the words themselves that this is no other than the one that also communicated with Moses. Page 18. Since the scripture in the same words and in reference to the same one says, when the Lord saw that he drew near to him to see, the Lord called to him from the midst of the bush saying, Moses, Moses. And he answered, here am I. But he said, draw not nearer, loose thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place on which thou standest is holy ground. And he said to him, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Again, we see as representing the book of Eusebius, which is another historian who lived during the time of the falling of the second temple period or the second temple. When he read Exodus 3.15, he's reading, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob in Exodus 3.15. He's disseminating the same words that was given in Exodus 3.14. Moreover, and in introducing another name is not what we're noticing that the historians are seeing. Continue, bro. There's no name that can properly be given to the almighty creator. According to our witnesses, Genesis 3.15 reads, Aleph Ha Yaha, I am the God of, or Elohim, or Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Central to any question is the reason why, and the answer lies in provoking a deeper understanding. When the Almighty spoke his chosen appellation, I am, as we proclaim, Ahaya, conveying he is the answer to all questions. The essence of existence, the reason behind all that is seen, unseen, and beyond imagination, he is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the embodiment of consciousness, encompassing the mind, body, soul and spirit he is the creator of everything the universe the father when moses was instructed to tell the children of israel that i am sent him it affirmed their salvation from the egyptians 
and establish the one true Allah making his response to Moses or Masha the ultimate representation of this divine truth. That being encompassed in those words, though it be would be not be proper just to say that the most high can have a name given by men. And even if we don't say those letters the correct way or in the proper pronunciation, we know that those lettering formations in Exodus 314 is what he disseminated to us. How we read it is a whole nother matter. Continue. The genuine article. The phrase I am that I am is echoed by Philo and our historical sources aligning with the authentic teachings of the second temple period, dating back almost 2000 years. Notably, the Tetragrammaton was not originally inscribed in Exodus 315. I am thy God reflects the genuine ancient expression uttered by the Almighty before Moses was sent to the children of Israel. The Almighty is not a man that he should be named, and there is truly no name that can properly be assigned to him. Likewise, Philo states, Brother Najib. It was therefore quite consistent with reason that no proper name could with propriety be assigned to him who is in truth the living God. Do you not see that to the prophet who is really who is really desirous of making an honest inquiry after the truth and who asks what answer he is to give to those who question him as to the name of him who has sent him. He says, I am that I am, Exodus chapter three, verse 14, which is equivalent to saying, it is my nature to be, not to be described by name. Continue, bro. So also stating on dreams that they are God sent. Philo also states for in other passages, the sacred historian, when he considered whether there was really any name belonging to the living God, showed that he knew that there was none properly belonging to him. But what whatever appellation anyone may give will be an abuse of terms for the living God is not of the nature to be described, but only to be. And a proof of this may be found in the the orator's answer given by God to the person who asked what name he had. I am that I am, Exodus 3.14, that the questioner might know the existence of those things which it was not possible for man to conceive, not being connected with God. So we know that the Most High truly, there is no proper name that we can describe, but the fact that the Most High gave us one, out of his mouth would be indicative of what we should call on. And we should have, we would have great respect with that. Continue, bro. Does the Hebrew 1961 and the Hebrew 3068 have the same meaning? It's essential to highlight that many scholars and historians have made the claim that the Hebrew HYH or Hayah meaning to be in the root forms of the Tetragrammaton, HWH or Hawa, share the same meaning. However, we will briefly demonstrate that their meaning are not identical and do not share any common origin, as only one of them is originally a Hebrew word. Does the Tetragrammaton have the same meaning as Brother Banya? This assumption that Yahweh is derived from the verb to be has seemed to be implied in Exodus 3 and 14 is not, however, free from difficulty. To be in the Hebrew of the Old Testament and not Hawa as the deriv der derivation would require, but higher and we are thus driven to the further assumption that Hawa belongs to an earlier stage 
if the language or to some older speech of the forefathers of the Israelites. This hypothesis in not in, intrinsically improbable and in aromatic, a language closely related to Hebrew to be actually is hard. But it should be noted that in adopting it, we admit that using the name Hebrew in the historical sense, Yahweh is not a Hebrew name. So the connection, and I mean, some have made this connection, that the Hebrew 1961 for Haya would also have a connection to the Hebrew for the word of Hawa, um, and that they would mean to be or to exist. But we, we're, as we're looking at in the Encyclopedia Britannica, that this hypothesis is not intrinsically improbable. And, and in Aramaic, a language closely related to the Hebrew actually is Hawad or Had, but it should be noted that in adopting it, we admit that the, the using the name in Hebrew in the historical sense, the Tetragrammaton is not a Hebrew name. So the roots that one would get from um, the connection of the word Hawa would not be in connection to the Hayah that we see inside the Hebraic text, but that that word would actually come from the Aramaic or come from a different source. It would not originally be a Hebrew word to say that existence has the same meaning for them both. Continue, bro. Order in history. Brother Banya. The rich etymological debate concerning the name of Yahweh with its very educated conjecture, some more plausible than others, but none conclusive, must be concluded as irrelevant to our problem. The narrative itself does not refer to any meaning attached to the name of Yahweh that could have influenced the content of the revelation. On the contrary, it presents the name as one whose meaning is unknown, so that an exegesis is necessary in order to endow it with spiritual vitality. The exegesis, furthermore, is not intended as an etymology. As far as we know, the Iya has etymologically no more to do with Yahweh than Masha with Moshe. That is nothing at all. The exegesis plays with the, the fit phonetic illusion, but its meaning is autonomous. So the exegesis furthermore is not intended that in etymology, as far as we know, AA, and the etymological no more to do with Yahweh than Masha and Moshe. And it is profoundly states that it will have no connection. I mean, not nothing at all. So when those say that they mean the same thing, it's saying that it doesn't because it's not even known where the, the wording that we get the tetragrammaton from or commonly we call it, where does it even come from? And it has no connection with the, what the Most High said inside Exodus 3.14. So when we, we notice that we have this Tetragrammaton or YHWH written over 7,000 times in the Bible, we already established that clearly it wasn't written inside the book of Genesis. And that, that the notion that the capital letters for Lord means the Tetragrammaton is something we've been given. Because when Philo and Josephus are reading the Old Testament, as in their time, 2000 years ago, when the temple was still erected, they're seeing the titles for Lord and God. They're not seeing these, the, these, uh, any references to the Tetragrammaton. Um, continue, bro. Now we made a statement prior regarding the Hebrew 1961. And most people say, well, how can the Hebrew 1961 be a connection to the name of the Most High? It's a common verb. 
So every time you see the Hebrew 1961 in the scriptures, one thinks Haya, Haya, Haya. That's what they think they're looking at. But when you go into the Strong's, Haya is not the only one that's connected with the term or that verb uh, to be. But as you're saying here, you have over 100 different wordings that are all represented under the Hebrew 1961, but have different spellings and different occurrences in Scripture. So when one says that they see the Hebrew 1961 and they say, oh, that, that always means the verb uh, haya is incorrect. Because they're all represented by all these wordings here. And we couldn't fit all of them on, on the screen. So when you're looking at your strong, you're saying the Hebrew 1961, and you're saying, oh, that's that's HYH. You don't get a chance to see unless you go into the language that all these denotions, all these citations are listed under the Hebrew 1961, but they have all these different spellings. Some starting with ba ya uh, ba wa tam we continue on, you'll see that they have different spellings, but you only notice that they try to convolute the Haya part of it. They want you to think about the Haya part just being the only one that you see over thousands of times representing a, a verb or a common verb. This brings even special significance to the fact that once the Ane is connected to it, it goes from a verb to a noun. But this is just to uncover the fact that when you see Haya, it does not always mean that you're looking at uh, HYH, but that the Hebrew 1961 has a multitude of spellings just by going into the language. Why was it convoluted that way? Why were we made to think that that's what it was talking about? I guess that's a question we all can ask ourselves. Continue, bro. Is there a plausible explanation to what we just saw was what we just talked about? While some variations may be may be attributed to prefixes and suffixes, it's, it's not without you know um, it's not it's not it's not without being conceivable that some of them are prefixes and suffixes. Not all can simply be categorized as the Hebrew 1961. Strong Concordance and Brown Driver Briggs, which we mainly look up through our ESOR, exclusively interpret the Hebrew 1961 as Haya, which can be misleading. These Hebrew letters, Haya, form the initial three letters in the Almighty spoken name. Why convolute them with a bunch of different words or translations that all fall under the Hebrew 1961. And the only way for you to see that is to go to some external source that gives you the exact letters, according to the Masoret and sometime to the, the, the ancient Hebrew text, is the only way that you would know, make that notice. Out, without doing that, you would say, oh, that's just a common verb. So it says, though it is often viewed as a common verb, leading to disputes about its appropriateness as being a part of the proper name. A lot of our arguments come from that. Is that, oh, no, that's just a regular verb. Continue, bro. The works of Philo on the flight and findings in Young's title, The Tristeed and Fugitives. And I'll just, just say this real quickly. Therefore, do not doubt either whether that which is more ancient than an existing thing is indescribable when his very word is not to be mentioned by us according to his proper name. Now we have proclaimed the name, but Philo is making a statement saying the very word, we say Ahaya Shah Ahaya or Ea Asha Ea, as in the total, but when he says I have sent, I am sent to Moses, that very word was not to be spoken by us frivolously. We wasn't supposed to throw him on wristbands and t-shirts and headbands and things like that or to make merchandise of it. We wasn't supposed to just say it commonly as if we're talking about uh, Joe the janitor. That our people back at the Second Temple period didn't say the name as in his very word by itself. And I prayed it the most high as in our articulation just to make it known that we have not fallen upon some error to bring this information. But we, but they had the utmost respect. His very word wasn't mentioned. We know historically that it was mentioned in the temple by the priests, but the merchandise of the clothing and 
to just calling it out like you're talking about your neighbor. This was not done. Continue. Naming the Almighty, uh, Brother Najib. Philo profoundly conveys his very word as, I don't mention any. He strategically avoids directly mentioning the first person singular, adhering to respectful discretion. Philo quotes the Almighty's name only when intertwined with other words like, I am that I am, and I am the God. His intention is to show the highest reverence, fearing to utter the singular form, demonstrating deep respect for the creator and complying with the law. So Philo, when he spoke it, he spoke it in unison as I am that I am. He spoke it in unison, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But his very word, he didn't just speak it cavalierly. And I know a lot of our people don't use the name given in Exodus 314. They use forms of the Tetragrammaton. Um, but even with that, because they believe that's the name, they use it in a sense of, in the ways that our people did not do. They didn't throw it on their clothing. The only piece of clothing that had the most high's name was the temple priest. And it was inscribed on his mitri. They didn't do as we do today when we believe we have the most high's name and put it on t-shirts. We sell the t-shirts. We, we speak it like we're talking about a person we met recently when that was, that was not a clean thing to do. Continue. The Septuagint. And then this, in this, we see the commandment in the Septuagint as paraphrased in the, in the book works of Philo. It says, according to Philo, who lived in the first century C, common era, or AD, the law dictates that we should not casually invoke or speak the Almighty's name. This principle, as noted by Philo, finds support in the Septuagint. Now, we know that the, the, the Ish powers, they went so far with it that they just took it from us. And, you know, we believe that their way of not speaking the name was uh, their plot, you know, um, but even our people had a respect to it. And them Ish people hijacked it and made us look at it unfavorably. It says, now, originally, the Leviticus 24, 15, according to Philo, reads this way. Brother Banya? Levit Leviticus 24 and 15. And speak unto the sons of Israel, and thou shalt say unto them, Whosoever shall curse God shall bear his sin. And he that names the name of the Lord, let him die the death. Let all the congregation of Israel stone him with stones, whether he be a stranger or a native. Let him die for naming the name of the Lord. Now, according to the law, and if you go into the Septuagint, we don't have an exclusive copy of it. Naming the name of the Most High was worthy of being stoned. It wasn't spoken freely and cavalierly that way you got to think we're talking about the creator of all things way beyond any honor that we can bestow upon him and we say his name like it's like it's it's regular and then we say he wants us to do that there are contexts to saying the most high's name to declare it to pray you know but to say it in the way that we use it today it was not so continue On the life of Moses, the book of Philo, brother Najee. But after the punishment of this impious murderer, a new commandment was enacted, which had never before been taught worthy of being reduced to writing. But unexpected innovations caused new laws to be devised for the repression of their evils. At all events, the following law was immediately introduced. Whosoever curses God shall be guilty of sin, and whoever names the name of the Lord shall die. This is seen in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 15. Well done, O all wise men. You alone have drunk of the cup of unallowed wisdom. 
You have seen that it was worse to name God than even to curse him. For you would never have treated lightly a man who had committed the heaviest of all impieties and inflicted the heaviest punishment possible on those who committed the slightest faults. But you fixed death, which is the very greatest punishment imaginable as the penalty for the man who appeared to have committed the heaviest crime. As we see in the book of Philo, like these, this says, God shall, says that any man who names him as whoever curses God shall be guilty of sin and whoever names the name of the Lord shall die. It says, well done, O wise man. You alone have drunk of the cup of unalloyed wisdom. You have seen that it is worse to name God than even to curse him. You know, we saying the name of God, we, we need to remember how sacred that is. That we, though knowing it, because it says the Most High's name is written in us, but the way that our people believe that they should use it, even though then, you know, we would say that they're using a name that, that was not given in Exodus 3.14, they still believe it to be his name. And we're noticing that a lot of merchandise is made of. It spoke freely and willingly almost in every conversation as if they're talking about uh, one that is uh, of common earthly descent. And we're showing you that this was not so according to ancient historians, as well as inside, written inside the original commandment. Continue. Also, we can see along, we look inside, it says, do not take the Almighty's name in vain. We go into the book of Sirach, and we have further support inside the Apocrypha. Holy Bible, King James Version, Brother Banya. Sirach 23 and 9. Accustom not thy mouth to swearing, neither use thyself to the naming of the Holy One. Sirach 23 and 10. For as a servant that is continually beaten shall not be without a blue mark, so he that sweareth and nameth God continually shall not be faultless. So when we're talking about not getting thy shoes used to naming the Holy One, naming the Most High's name perpetually for any reason or just for any conversation was not to be used. It was a sacred thing that only the priest did predominantly in the temple of the Most High at the Feast of uh, Passover, at the Feast of uh, Tabernacles on the Day of Atonement. These things were used by the high priest alone. When we name the Most High now, we make the proclamation, proclamation to proclaim, and we got to be very seasonable with that. We make it in prayer. And then knowing it in our hearts when we speak is one thing compared to speaking it, how we commonly use the tetragrammaton today, just saying it and throwing it out there. And if you got it shirt on, you see the Hebrew characters, Yad, Hey, Wav, Hey, and every, you know, in, in different lettering formations, even to be sold. That right there was something that we fell into and hopefully that we can come out of. Um, continue. On the life of Moses, and I'll take this part, it says, but as it seems, he is not speaking that God, who was the first being who had any existence and the father of the universe, in order that no one, not one, no one of the disciples of Moses ever became accustomed at all to treat the abolition of God with disrespect for that name is always most deserving to obtain the victory and is especially worthy of love. But if anyone were, I say to blaspheme against the Lord of gods and men, or were even to dare to utter his name unseasonably, he must endure the punishment of death for those persons who have a proper respect for their parents. Do not lightly bring forth the names of the parents, though they, are but mortal, but they avoid using their prop their proper names by reason of the reverence which they bear them. How many people in here say, Yo, what's up, John, to their father? What's up, Lucille, to their mother? You would almost expect a smack to the face, even in your old age. If we understand this respect and we be the children of the Most High, how come we don't understand this when it comes to the Most High? Because we've been taught the precepts of men. 
We've been taught that the most high wants you just constantly throwing his name out there unseasonably in any way you want. But we won't even do this to our parents because inside we know it's disrespectful. How can we not know the disrespect to the creator of the universe? And it says, and call them rather by their titles. What's the, your mother and father's title? And indicating the natural relationship that is father and mother, by which names they at once intimate the unsurpassable benefits which they have received at their hands and their own grateful disposition. Well, and some unsurpassable uh, benefits have you received from your parents? Being weaned from the milk, clothing, shelter, food, everything that you've ever been get. Now think about who gave your parents those means to which to give it to you. How unsurpassable is the most high's name? How much more respect and reverence should we give there if we even respect our parents? That way there's a reason we don't call our parents by their names. Therefore, these men must not be thought worthy of pardon who out of volatility of tongue have spoken unceasingly, and being too free of their words have represent or repeated carelessly the most holy and divine name of God. It was that it was the purpose of the nations of our oppressors to guide us to ignore what the most high had plainly spoken to us. Let's read that again. It was the purpose of the nations of our oppressors to guide us to ignore what the Most High had plainly spoken to us. They led us down this road. It made it easier by just capitalizing Lord. And once we were able to find out any semblance of a title, we ran with it. They taught us these things. Even forgot the small connection that we would make to our own parents that we wouldn't even call them by their names only in the introduction. And as we are introducing the Most High's name today, we have spoken it. But even in our vocation, you have not heard any lessons where we say the name. You have not heard it, though we know it. Go back in the archives of this channel and you won't see very seldomly, if any, that we have spoken it. We speak in the hear, the proclaim. And after that, we know it as it's written in us. Continue. So we conclude by saying the only name the Almighty spoke to Moses and the children of Israel is the name written in Exodus 3.14. You got to remember, it says to obey my voice, which is I am. And I am is just an English translation of what was given to our people Hebraically. And we can't say we can say that with absolute certainty, but we can say Aleph He Yahe, which the Most High, as we say it today, is a, is a higher. So we'll say Shalom Zion. And we pray that this presentation was edifying and I pray that you go back and look at it again and check all the information and can see, you know, what eyes that see and ears that they, they hear. All praise, honor, and glory to the Most High. That was an awesome lesson. Um, can I, brother, are you, are you there? Can you hear me? All praise, honor, and glory to the Most High. That... Hey, brother Bonnie, I'm here. I can hear you, bro. Yeah, that was an awesome, an awesome lesson. I hope, I hope everybody was able to absorb that information, because given the times that we are in, it, it is absolutely paramount that we stay within the realms of respect concerning the most high, right? Um, we can call him most high, call him father, you know, but, you know, we, we cannot, we cannot use the most high's name cavalierly. Um, the information that was shown in this video, I have not seen anybody do this level of studying not anywhere on youtube where you can get this much information and you can know for sure that the most high's name is what he told moses um what else can i say man this awesome lesson our brother elisha this information he's been studying this information for how many years brother elisha Brother Lasha, 
Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure that he's there. I, I know he's been doing it for a lot of years. I, I think it's. I think it might be well over five years. Um, that that he's been studying this. Probably when I say well over five years, I mean I mean something like ten. You know, if if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I, I think this information is is tremendously important, um, especially in the times that we are in today. Um, we are supposed to be getting back to the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. And as we know, the first of those commandments um, is, is all about uh, honoring the Most High and, and keeping his name, you know, um, not taking his name in vain and, and loving the Most High above all else and having no gods before him and making no other gods uh, on the earth or, or from the sea or anything like that. And so the times that we are in right now, we have to be really, really aware of what we are doing when we are mentioning the Most High's name. And, you know, we are in this process of getting back to who, where we were as Israel. And even in doing that, we may think, you know, you know people have a lot of ways a lot of different names that they refer to the Most High as. But what we are saying here and what Elijah, I think, has brought out is that it's most proper to refer to the Most High as our Father, refer to the Most High as the Most High, <laughs> refer to him in a way where you are just not using his name cavalierly. You're just not mentioning it in vain. You're just not saying it, putting it on baseball caps and T-shirts and coffee cups we are just not using the name of our Allah in a way that can be disrespectful to him um and again i just think brother lasha did a great great job bringing that out absolutely and uh just to repeat some of the sentiments that he he's uh he's conveyed to me it's like you know when you when you see other nations you know they don't wear the name of their their creator or their, their God on their shirts or on their hats and things like they don't do that, you know? Um, and how much more should we esteem our father, right? How much more should we esteem the most high being the, 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 the Allah of all things, you know, the creator of all things, as it is written, the, the gods of the nations are idols, but the most high made the heaven and earth. Right. So, we're, we're talking about the real one. We're talking about the originator. We're not talking about an idol. We're talking about a spirit, a spirit that existed beyond, you know, beyond what we can fathom, right? We can't even fathom what the most high is, you know, but we have to understand if he created us and he has, he esteemed us his children, then we ought to we ought to walk with that the, the highest level of fear, regard, and respect for him. Right? Brother Lasha, I had asked earlier how long you were studying studying this information, because I know it, it's going it's going on some long, a long period of time, you know, just to put the information together. But if you can recollect, when was the first time when the spirit was dropped on you to do this lesson? Um, honestly, uh, I think that this lesson was building to me ever since you told me that that was the most high's name, you know, um, when I was saying Yahuwah at the time, you know, I was a tetragrammaton. I was saying, saying the tetragrammaton myself. And from the moment it pricked my heart that when you said to me, what did the most high say? I couldn't get that out of my head. And I say from that point. I started, I knew I was going to do, I ain't going to say I knew I was going to start going into the information, but then it started to affirm more and more and more over time, you know? So it took, it took a long time and uh, looked through a lot of things and tried to get better understanding on why certain things were being used. And I think the most I gave those answers. I think that our people, it's a reason we was cast out of the land. We wasn't cast out of the land because we were doing the right thing or even calling on the name of the Most High. 
if we were doing those things, then we wouldn't be in America right now. We wouldn't be scattered to the four corners of the earth. So it, was, it wasn't just the fact that we broke some of the law, statutes, and commandments. We started to call on other gods, and we cleave to those gods. And we assimilate or we um, infuse the name of other gods into the truth of the Most High and made the truth of the Most High alive. And the purpose of bringing this information together is because the Most High said his name will be written in our foreheads. So it was, it was never the intent to uh, accumulate the information and bring it out. And then a person taking switch the tetragrammaton off their wristband and skull cap and garment, and then just put the, the name that the Most High gave in Exodus 3.14. This is just so it could be written in your heart. When the Most High delivers his people and it says, uh, all those who call upon the name of the Most High shall be saved, that we know it, that we believe them. Because this is really what it comes down to. Do we believe the Most High in what he said? Because right now we got a lot of excuses why people was able to explain it away. So even going into any information, just like for anybody that teaches our people or disseminates information to our people, man, you, you spend a lot of time reading books and reading through a lot of things you're not going to use. 90, 95% of what you read, 99% of what you read, you're not going to use. You're extracting small tidbits of uh, information and you're doing a lot of searching just to help your people see the truth like all the brothers do not just us but all the other brothers and sisters and even you yourselves with your family and friends you know so and then we have more on this this is not even everything you know this is just a, um, a portion of a greater work you know so you i'll know, say that uh, what mm -hmm. you just said is profound, bro. Um, if, if, if others were privy to the conversation that I have with my big bro today, man, and we was talking about that in the sense of how when we do the work, you know, a lot of times people think that if the most I give you a work and it is to be done, and, and just before I say this, you know, this, this work is it, it has the divine purpose in it. No matter what that work was given to you and it was going to get accomplished because the Most High set his will out for that to, to happen. If the Most High chose you to bring some information out and you, and you try to run from it, you can't run from what the Most High tell you to do, right? He's not going to say, oh, well, you don't, uh, a lot of y'all don't want to do it. So, you know, uh, I think I'll move on to the next person, right? I, I think I'll move on to someone else who want to do it. Now, the Most High's will is sovereign. It's absolute. So when he say you're going to do something, it's no changing it up. No matter what you say, or how you try to get away from it. You can try to be Jonas, but the Most High have a well swallow you up and spit you out where you're supposed to be or where he said you're supposed to be at. You can go before him and say, you know, like Moses, hey, I'm not I'm not that smart. I'm not I'm not that knowledgeable. I don't know the people not going to believe you. Believe me. No, the Most High, who made the seeing or the blind? Right. Who made the lame? The Most High did that. That's why this this. This lesson to me has divine purpose in it because no matter what you've been through and what happened within your life, this stayed in your spirit and it stayed in your spirit even until now to be accomplished, right? And that's how we got to look at it when, when, when we start talking about the walk that the Most High gave us and the things that the Most High chose us to complete, right? If the Most High chose you to do a work, it's nothing you can do about it. The work is yours and it will be done because his will is absolute. His will is absolute and it's nothing you can do about it. Most High said, saw to the earth bring out the second Exodus and the 400 year prophecy. His will be done. It will be done because again, it is absolute. And I want everybody to understand that. You know, I want everybody to understand that when we start talking about faith, we start talking about hope, we start talking about purpose, we have a purpose in this earth. 
We are not our own. You understand what I'm saying? We are not our own. We belong to someone. And this lesson is important to me because when you look at the things that's happening in, in the world, you got that eclipse about to happen and they calling the National Guard out for an eclipse. Really? And guess what? We was I was listening to, to the news anchor and I'm like, yo, why are they bringing out the National Guard on the eclipse? And the news anchor was like, well, you know, there's eclipses all the time. But what makes this eclipse special is because it happens every 400 years. So let that sink in, Zion. 400 years. We told brothers and sisters that we've been here for 400 years, almost 400 years. April 8th will mark the time. April 8th. We, 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 we gone through the information, left and right, up and down, back and forth. Our deliverance is drawn near, and we need to walk circumspect. All right? So look for it. Wait for it. Hope for it. Prepare yourselves. All right? You brothers got anything to add? Brother Najib? No, I just want to say real quick, uh, I just, you know, want to definitely echo everything uh, Brother Banya said. You know, we, we got some exciting uh, some exciting times coming up with, with the eclipse that's happening. Um, I do, um, I've said this before, but, you know, I, I, I don't want anyone to, to go out there thinking that something or expecting that something else is going to happen other than what the most high has given us. I'm not saying that something else won't happen, you know, but we, we are already seeing, and we have been seeing, you know, since this 400 years has been up since uh, 2019, 2020, we have been seeing some amazing things happening um, in, in conjunction with our awakening. So just know that this is a sign. This is a sign of, of the most high, and that could be enough for you. That could be enough for you to know that the Most High is giving you a sign, telling you that his word is true, and that is enough. Um, thank everybody uh, for, for hanging with us today on this Shabbat. Um, it's just kind of closing out for me here on the West Coast. Um, me and Brother Bonio has probably been over for you guys uh, for quite some time now on the, on the East Coast, but um, thanks for hanging with us. Um, hope you really got something out of this uh out of this lesson, uh, Brother Lasha put a lot of work into this. Um, and, um, you know, I salute him for this, for, you know, being a steward of the Most High and, and, and bringing out this word. So thank you, Brother Lasha, and thank you, fam, for hanging with us. Um, and uh, be blessed. Thank you. Close us out, bro. Close us out, Elijah. Yeah, yeah um, I just want to um, appreciate my brothers, Brother Banya. Brother uh, Naji, also Brother Cleo out there somewhere. Um, I think that our people should look at look at the information given and scrutinize it. You know, if you believe that we went wrong somewhere, you should scrutinize that information and work out your soul salvation with fear and trembling. Like work out within yourself why you cleave to what you cleave to, and ask yourself: Is is it? Can we just ignore what the Most High said? Can it be explained away? And I'll say this too, is that, you know, I, I put in time like we all do in research and trying to bring things out and whatnot. And my brothers right here uh, are invaluable to me that we, we do all these things together. You know, whether one of us write down precepts, read the history, we do all these things together. So um, I know they pouring a lot of stuff my way. We, we, I can I'm gonna undo that real quick. We do these things together. There's nothing um, that uh, that was presented that we haven't all talked about. Even many, maybe, maybe many years ago, we spoke about, you know, outside of uh, going into some books um, and, and just add more information to it. So all praises be to the most high um, praying for Zion's restoration. Just to throw a tidbit out there when when April 8th does come, know that it no doubt it's a sign. It's not the time. 
but it's definitely it's definitely a sign and when when the the heathen in the world you know get dismayed at the signs in the heavens mosai tells us not to be dismayed you know because we got we got an ace we got an ace right uh up our sleeve you want to put it that way if something happens the most high is with us if, if nothing happens the most high is with us if they try to do something to most high is with us every way you look at it the most high is with us so it's really nothing for us to be afraid of you know the one who controls it all is with his people and we are the saints of the most high we are zion we've been scattered to the four corners of the earth and the most high is definitely going to deliver his people and that 400 years that 400 years is just about up so the judgments will be poured out on this nation so most high will we'll see y'all again soon all praise be to the most high god of israel by shim yashai his son and to all of zion's elects scattered to the four corners of the earth peace and blessings peace and blessings family